Just give me one Hello. second. Just one little second. Can we get a prank hands emoji in the comments right now? Uh, yes, we can. That one right there. Get a prank hands emoji for this video. All right, we have we have a beer crack. Uh, yep, we have uh, Fat Tuesday is in. Was it? It's this week. I gotta get all this beer out of my fridge because I'm cutting it out of my diet entirely until Easter. Oh, good luck. See, I just resolved to so stop got, drinking on the weekdays. Yeah, got it. For me. Empty out the fridge before that period comes. Yes. All right. And hello, everybody. We're doing the Normie Vampire Clan. What do you mean, Normie Vampire Clan? It's just a Normie up as Clan. The rest of them. This is this is the most middle of the road vampire clan anyone can ever play as. Why is that? There's nothing dangerous about the Toreador. There's nothing overly virtuous about the Toreador. They're just normal. This is the clan that just kind of exists. And because of how little they do in terms of history, where I I'm going to get into like more detail about the history as to where they stand, but. Because of that, this clan has no major commitments that you have to stick with. They have no society that they're super gung-ho about. They don't have any ideas that they're super gung-ho about. You can just do whatever with the Toreador as long as it falls under the purview of artist or art collector. Yes. That's it. You you can just do you can't just do anything with the Toreador. I mean, I was looking through the first edition book, and I have my reservations with that book because it really doesn't tell you all that much about it's how to play. Because there's not that much to tell in all honesty. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but at the same time, like it could have gone more in depth. Like John had to had to comb through the very poorly pixelated uh, second edition book to get me my so, notes for this for this episode. Yeah, our 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 buddy who sends me um, these books. Because I'm on a budget, and he has all this shit already. I uh, had, like, a fucked up scanned copy of it, so I could barely understand what the fuck I was listening to, and I did not purchase a copy in time for the video. Yes. So, I was working with shit, but to describe to you, like, what I mean with how versatile the Toreador is, these are all, like, the character concepts at the back of the first edition book, uh, which uh, was a clean scan. I was able to get um, that one easily watchable. And look at just how much these ideas jump around. I mean, with with the Sabra and the Ventru, you had a very clear cut idea as to what those were going to be. The Toreador, it can just be anything. It really can't just be anything. I mean, I check mean, all this stuff out. You, you I, see how well, wildly different these character concepts are. Yeah, I I personally was a fan of the speed metal guitarist one. Let me find that one. Cause no, I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to it before you can. Here's the martial artist. Take a look at this one. The martial artist. Oh yeah. Yeah, the martial artist. In I case in case you want to play the vampire version of um, oh fuck, who is it? I'm forgetting the Mortal Kombat. Shit Lee. Johnny, no Johnny. Uh, Johnny Cage. Johnny Cage. That's it. He's even yeah. wearing the sunglasses. Look at him. It, even as he's like a John Claude Van Damme combined with Steven Seagal. The plastic surgeon who, you know, specked into, who specked into vicissitude. Uh, there's the guy you're looking for. He looks like the, he looks like Jeffrey Cuddle Trousers from, uh, what was it? Anger, or uh, Hatred, that was it. Yeah, yeah, Hatred. <laughs> that, that's his official name you can find on the wiki? <laughs> yes. And then there's, uh, <laughs> uh, Marilyn Manson over here. Yeah. <laughs> And a bit back. You see what I mean by say this is normie, where you can just do whatever with this concept. To really. an extent that honestly might make it more fun, because that adds yeah, that, a much needed variety into the story. I told you during the Zemichi episode that the Zemichi was the group that I saw the most fan art of. The Toreador is the claim that I see the most stories where people say they played as a Toreador because of how easy it is to pick up in concept. Same with the Bruja, where yes. the Toreador and the Bruja are the most popular clans to play as in Vampire, because you really can't just do anything with the concept. Yeah, that, I mean, where? they're they're good beginner classes. Like, if you want a more combat-focused Vampire game, you're starting with Bruja. If you want a more roleplay-heavy Vampire game, you start with the, with the Toreador. It's like recommending uh but i recommend somebody uh play the glass walkers when you start because your your whole shtick is you like technology you can go wherever you want with that concept i don't tell people children of gaia because as it turns out pacifism 
is a very specific idea and there's different ways to tackle pacifism that follow a longer deeper train of thought than you would initially believe yes that takes a lot of of you know commitment to the role to do properly yeah because you you had the patient deed you had the anointed ones we're not talking about wolves today we're talking about the honestly this is the vampire clan that has the least to do with werewolf yes the toreador so we're still going to call this um gallard's guide to werewolf uh either way well yeah but even still it, it's that's just the identity of the channel at this point yeah and let me bring up that i was not a fan of second edition because that entire book is filled with a pack of lies and i'm not talking like um gloss workers first edition where there's some information uh, that's in it that, and that's accurate but you can tell that the glass workers are deliberately keeping some stuff out of the story toreador second edition the framing device is that it's an elder toreador telling their child deliberate misinformation to mislead them that and, that sounds like somebody had two freebie points that they put into like you know what was that called i forget what that was called in the in the official rule set it's um uh, it's the background that lets you lie but looking at this no so not the original the... book was okay the original ahead. book was written by stephen brown uh stephen c brown who if i'm to go through the rest of his credits he's been he was with white wolf up until what is it 2011 and he did a little bit of stuff for the mind's eye theater guide in 2014 and then he just completely falls off the record i have no idea whether or not this guy's still alive because there's no real way i can get in contact with him either it does, um, it does kind of suck. I'm, I'm tempted to scour LinkedIn at this point to find the White Wolf staff. Yeah, to try to find these guys. I would love to talk with uh, Brian Campbell. That guy, uh, Brian Campbell and Ethan Skimp, I would really like to have a conversation with. I'll, I'll dig um, through LinkedIn see if I can find him. Uh, this guy also wrote Freak Legion, um, the Toreador guy. Ooh. I mean, I, so, I like Freak Legion just like as a concept. Yeah, and you know that book had a lot of really good ideas. Oh, yeah. Second edition, on the other hand, follows along the trend that a lot of vampire books from second edition tended to do, where you ended up getting a whole bunch of guys that did not read the previous book that started writing this book, and instead we get Heather Grove and Greg Stoles, who wrote this. I'm going to be honest. I feel like that's part of the reason there's so much, like... I feel like what they were trying to avoid when it comes to writing all of the all the clan books and all the tribe books for the World of Darkness is that if you keep adding rules to everybody else's book, eventually whoever writes the last book is going to have so many different like rules and plot holes to watch out for that it becomes yes. goddamn impossible to write them. But in doing so, they accidentally gave them too much leniency and now none of the stories match up. Yeah, because Heather's wheelhouse was Wraith. That's what she worked on. She worked on Wraith, and she joined the company around 2001. Greg Stoles, on the other hand, was a guy who wrote for Hunter the Reckoning. So it only makes sense they pull guys off the projects that they were making their own storylines for to write something for the Toreador book, and now you've just got the framing device of an elder giving a child deliberate misinformation, where you have a book that ultimately fucking sucks, and it's filled with so much clearly conflicting and incorrect information. I'm going to say this book is worse than some, uh, than Shadow Lord's Second Edition. I told you that Shadow Lord's Second Edition is almost unreadable. This book belongs in one place, and it is your garbage can. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm dead serious when I say I am glad that I did not get to purchase this in time because by the time it was going to be in my hands, I said, "Well, fuck it," and I, I didn't want a digital copy. So, um, I saved money by not purchasing this, and I think you should too, because I think this book is completely useless. Yeah, but first edition isn't all that much better. Like, John sent me the first edition book, and, like, my usual, my usual categories when I'm commentating on the show are, is the embrace, the relationships, and their, uh, their main discipline, which in this case is presence. But the book had fuck all of that, except for anything in presence above rank 6, and for that, I'm using the wiki, because the wiki's actually complete. 
Yeah, because um, what was it like the S S uh, Selegia Wiki you're using? Selegia Wiki, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that's a pretty good archive for werewolf information, uh, for vampire information. We highly recommend checking out that site. Yes. Okay. Anyways, uh, onward to history. Now I described a little bit about where these guys come from culturally. Would you like to guess uh, whose sibling the Toreador Antiluvian is? I'm trying to remember all the names because Cain sired a lot of fucking people. Now, now here's the thing. Erakel is a direct twin sibling of one of the Antiluvians. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Was, it wasn't Malkav, was it? It is Malkav. Hey, I got it right. Let's go. Yeah. Yep, this is something unique where I think Erakel and Malkav are the only two Antiluvians who are blood siblings with each other prior to being em embraced by the second generation. That's really Which, fascinating. And their history intersects a lot. So keep this in mind as we go through the history with them. Uh, most of this stuff is coming from Werewolf... Uh, I keep saying Werewolf. Vampire First Edition. With uh, the stuff that I thought was partially useful coming from second edition, uh, I'll go over that as we go along with it. See, I can go ahead and stop playing this song now. We begin in ancient times, the first city. Erakel and Malka were two siblings. Both of them were very intelligent people who caught the attention of Enoch, the first king. And of course, you uh, we don't need to go too big into details about it, but... Enoch decided that these two needed to live forever. Malkav was a genius. Erakel was a person who recognized genius. So they were both embraced. And the thing is, after their embrace, Erakel was noticed to have an obsession. She would find beauty, and she wouldn't stop admiring beauty. She would just stare at the sunset, or... Uh, like when she got up uh, very, very early in the morning to check out the sun. Or if she saw somebody she thought was beautiful, she would just stare at it and not do anything. It's like she was uh, like hypnotized. And this would eventually extend to the rest of her clan. Where, because of how uh, bloodlines work with vampires, you inherit the biggest flaw of your sire. That is Erykel's biggest flaw, but at the same time, is it really a flaw? I mean, you recognize something's beautiful, and besides it putting you in a stunned state, it kind of reminds you that you still are human, doesn't it? As a vampire? Yes. <laughs> that was that was the concept behind Colt, and that's part of where he is now, to an extent. Yeah, pro probably why you should have picked uh, Toriador for that game. I honestly was stuck between, well, I wanted Gangrel because I honestly wanted to play uh, Werewolf, but now I know how hard Werewolf is, so I should have yeah. played Malkavian, in all honesty. Yeah, he could have been the schizophrenic. Honestly, it would have made for a little bit better of a story, but in all honesty. <laughs> and uh, we would have had to fight you in the world game. <laughs> yeah, I know, that would that would have been rough. And the thing is, Malkav. Malkav is the mouthy twin brother. I'm pretty sure Malkav is uh, saying, you're only older than me by three minutes, or something like that, to Erakel. So he's got what well, looks like a little bit of inferiority complex when it comes to Erakel. So he decides he's going to act out by going over to Kane and just shit-talking the man to his face. Kane grabs him by the throat, throttles him, and using a very early form of dementation that would eventually be passed on to Malkav, dements him by showing him visions of heaven. Malkav drops to the ground, and he is complete batshit insane after that happens. Uh, only being able to be calmed down by interacting with Salat. As we detailed with the Salubri episode, Erakel had a crush on Salat. Where Salat tried doing the whole, uh, I'm the sage who knows everything shtick, I've yet to open my third eye, let me tell you about all my stuff. Erakel didn't listen to a thing he said because she was too busy looking at his man chest the entire time. And Salat eventually came back wearing a burqa, Erakel lost interest, and friendship over. Uh, it turns out we can't really talk with Salat anymore, because he doesn't like it when I stare at him. And Erakel didn't really have much in terms of relationships. She didn't talk with Malkav. Uh, Malkav and Erakel did love each other at the time, but they didn't really talk. 
and Arakel had a thing for one night stands. Back in the early days, she would just go around from person to person, uh, sleep with them for the entire night. And then the minute someone was up, she was out of the house, back at her house, and she would just never talk to that person again. She's she would uh, talk to you for one day, and that was it. A myth and lore, a pontifex <laughs> of oral sexual <laughs> ride you till your sword. And along this time, too, it was Arakel a pushover? No, Arakel was pretty badass, so let me tell you why. One of her other names, one of her many names, is Ishtar, the Sumerian goddess of love and warfare. As um, you remember what the disciplines are, right? You have presence, you have aspects, aspects. and you have celerity. Yes. Which, Where it if turns you guys out, know Ragnar, goes really, really fast. She she had this, and the only person who was faster than her was Ilyas, the Bruja Antiluvian. But in battle, um, Erakel, under her Ishtar moniker, was impossible to fight. She would just dodge all of your attacks, sway past everything you've got to throw at her. You just could not kill her in combat because, using like RPG terms, she was a dodge tank. You just could not do anything to her. Um, granted, fighting curves, it would be more like a death by a thousand cuts. Considering Erakel is more about getting out of situations and finding instead of direct combat because with that discipline spread, celerity, aspects, and presence, it's going to take a long time for you to fight certain enemies. I mean, you remember back when we were playing Vampire, uh, Meepian's character, Tabitha, wasn't exactly the best in combat. I think she killed a whopping two people that entire game. She did but mostly hand-to-hand. when it came hand to social to situations... Yeah, she yeah. did mostly hand-to-hand yeah, hand and had a sword. Uh, but, you know, it, rarely ever she took got damage. From a it's because that they have with the celerity, and any social situation she stepped into, she would just sweep the entire encounter. And thank God so for her. That's, that's what you do with... um. With uh, the Toreador. As for who she really talks to, eventually she would come into a disagreement with Set. We're not entirely sure what the argument was about, but Set tried to kill her, resulting in Malkav, for once in his life, standing up for his twin sister. And that was that. Erakil didn't want to stay in the first city anymore. So she ended up going all the way to Crete. Remember, remember this place, right? Yes, it is an island off the coast of Greece. She went over there and she had a great time with King Midas. You remember the guy who would touch stuff and he'll turn to gold? Yes, until he touched his dick and became gold member. <laughs> and, and in terms of King Gold member, Arakel was dating Midas at the time. I mean, this is the guy who's got all the money. She's she likes gold. Uh, she's going to hang out around with a man who can just make gold. And then Midas looks at her and says. Hey, uh, could you make uh, my son everlasting so when I die eventually, I mean, uh, a king who reigns forever that looks old? Uh, that's not going to be a good look for my kingdom, I'm sorry. Uh, it's got to be my son who does it. Could you make him everlasting? And Erakel says, no, that's a bad idea. You don't want me to do that. Midas insists, uh, insists on doing it anyway. And Erakel goes through with it, embraces the son. The son goes absolutely wild and begins to sludge in the Minotaur. King Midas is going, Erakel, where are you? How do I solve this? But as it turns out, Erakel is already gone. <laughs> She's lost interest in you, dude. She's off to the next man. She she did warn you ahead of time. And that son in question, frenzied, went crazy, embraced Midas. Midas then killed his son and then became the vampire King Midas of Crete. And that kind of segues into another story because, as it turns out, Clan Toreador has a lot of very interesting lore characters. I mean, all of them kind of uh, like play like the number two in a lot of their stories. You're going to notice as I talk about the Toreador, if I could describe them to a music, uh, compare them to a music group, it would be Howl Notes, where the Toreador are the Howl to whoever else is involved in the story's oats. She is. The entire clan is one half of a two-man band. 
Whoa, here where, she comes. Watch out, boy. Yeah. She'll chew you up. And um, what else is there? Uh, your 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 kiss is on my lisp. Yes. <laughs> uh, see, that that actually would be a pretty good playlist for a Torador, just having Hell Nuts music. I mean, yeah, pretty much. And looking at what they do, they don't really have any accomplishments by themselves. Everything they accomplish is with another person. Which is where we get into the story of Helena. So, we actually do have like a person on the cover. I'm, I sent you a copy of like the second edition book that's supposed to be Victoria Ash, who's the most fucking boring lore character in the world. She plays second fiddle to her own novel. <laughs> that's th that sounds like the Toreador in a, in a nutshell. Well, yeah, one well, like like I said, they uh they're the no they're number two to whoever else is out there is number one. Um. We actually have a pretty decent picture of what Helena looks like. So let me go ahead and let me post that in history pages. Now you may be asking me, we're talking about King Midas. Why is she wearing sunglasses? It's because she's still alive. So yeah. here's the crazy thing about her. Helena was the princess of a distant country, neighboring Crete, where King Midas decided that with his son dead and his wife presumably dead, he was going to make another wife. It was going to be Helena. Helena escaped and was rescued by a local do-good guy called Prius. I'll send you a picture of what he looks like. Uh, you spell it P-R-I-A-S. This is what he looks like. He's got the giga chain. He was, of course, he, he was the knight in shining armor. He came over to save Helena, but it wasn't any good. Midas found them, almost killed Prius, kidnapped Helena, uh forcibly embraced her, bloodbound her, forced her to crown him, and then 13 years of domestic abuse and rape ensued. Good lord. Uh, Midas is a fucking bastard. Yeah, the, the embrace fucked him up. I mean, you lose Erykel forever. Erykel walks out of your life. It's ruined. <laughs> See, I'm I mean, getting you, reminded of another song, but I can't think of it off the top of my head now. Yeah. You, you had the most beautiful woman to ever exist and will ever exist as your girlfriend, and now she's gone forever because she lost interest in you. That's despair right there. I mean, when you live forever, you're going to lose interest in people eventually. Yeah. So, 13 years go by, Prius comes back with a massive army, invades Midas's castle, and kills him. Uh, Helena is saved, but too late, she's a vampire. She decides that instead of letting Prius die, she was going to ghoul him because he didn't want to become a vampire as well. He wanted to, like, see the sun. And behold, they got saved and they got to live happily ever after. Nice. Ending. And that's the end of the first story. Now for the second story. Where they would eventually go into Carthage and Helena would put stock in Carthage around this time and would invest in it and hung around the Bruja that would run Carthage before, uh-oh, as it turns out, the stuff is about to go down with the Ventru in Rome. She sides with the Ventru, seeing the writing on the wall, and ends up betraying Carthage. Carthage falls. Uh, Helena looks like she's going to get a good place with the Ventru, but no. She's left in a place that's got no, um, no security from the sun. She's left there to die, as the Ventru say, a traitor dies a traitor's death. But once again, Prius comes and saves her. That place that had no windows? Pompeii. Oh. <laughs> they, and they put her in there days, like, like the day it was going to erupt is when they put her in there. Well, that's just terrible luck on their part. And next up, the New World, where around the time of 1820, she finally goes over to America. And this is interesting. She finds a place called the Succubus Club. Uh, I'll give you two guesses to what kind of establishment that is. Born. There was this massive whorehouse in Chicago in 1982. Is that the that same one that Al Capone by... got syphilis in? Yeah, that probably was. <laughs> <laughs> and the fun thing about it is that werewolves invaded it. Yeah, they saw what was going on in there. And a bunch of werewolves, presumably Shadow Lords, attacked it. Helena enters this massive fight, and to the surprise of myself and everyone else, 
she survives and kills the werewolves. I mean, to be fair, she's been alive since, like, before Christ, so... Exactly, but... But she lost something. Prius died in the fight. Uh... Once again, doing that whole knight in shining, shining armor shtick, he dies protecting her, and that drives her over to the despair event horizon, where now she exists as kind of like this like bitter witch queen who's running Chicago, and she is torn between do I want to sur- do I want to keep living and make everyone around me suffer for the loss I have because I have nothing left that I care for because I genuinely love Prius, I want to spend forever with him, and now he's gone. Or should I wait for something to kill me? And that's where her story currently stands. So it's very much like where uh, Salat is right now, staying in Dracula's castle, where it's like, do I go back and try to be a symbol of peace in the world, or do I, do I, you know, go the nihilist route and make everyone else suffer around me? Do I take the black pill, yes or no? Yeah, so that's two different clans who have, like, ancient vampires that have had that same conundrum. I mean, you live for that long, like, it makes you wonder, have you seen enough, or why are you still going? Well, it's very simple, because you but, don't know what go- what comes next, but you can find out. And we get some more interesting stories down the road, but we get to talk about the Punic Wars. Remember Carthage? Yes. Uh, here's what leads up to that. The Toreador are hanging around Greece around this time. Uh, after Erakel got sick of Crete, she went to, she went to Greece... And, funny enough, Erakel didn't participate in the killing of Cain's kids. The second generation, she didn't touch it. So when Cain did the curse, Erakel was actually spared from the curse because Erakel was completely innocent. Well, at least Cain recognized that. It was oddly nice of him. The, the only person who wasn't cursed was Ventru, and that's because Ventru was dead. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, um... Uh, he would have been spared because he actually like sided with Cain and fought alongside him, but died a violent death to Lasombra. And after she goes to Greece, the Sundering, uh, the, uh, the little curse that Cain cast that forces all the Antiluvians into torpor, it hits her. She can feel it coming. She quickly makes a tomb for herself in Mycia before she buries herself in it doesn't tell anybody where she is, and then takes a big snooze. And the Toreador Antiluvian just slips from memory. Just people f- just forget she ever existed. And around this time, you get the Toreador of Greece, who are looking at two cities, Sparta and Athens, and neither of them seem to like each other. They're both fighting, very interesting, See, uh, Sparta, they're all about war and child soldiers. Uh, they have nice helmets and breastplates and shields, but that's about it. What's going on in Athens? They go over at Athens, they meet Socrates, they meet Homer, they meet Plato, they meet Aristotle, they meet all these great minds, and I think the Bruja are running this place, and the Bruja are awesome. These guys are cool. They just start sitting over in Athens, hanging out, and then eventually you have to get out of Athens because it turns out the Ventru are knocking at your door about to tear Ath- Athens down. So they run over to Italy and then look and say, well, we, we really want to be in Athens, but we but Athens is over there. We can't really go to Athens anymore. Um, did you copy their homework? Yeah, yeah, you did. Okay, let's just build Athens here. And they did, and it was known as Rome. And basically, the whole reason that the Romans stole everything from the Greeks is because the Toreador copied their homework. And we get to talk about another lore character, Mikael, or as he's commonly referred to now, Michael. Oh, <laughs> I was I was confused there for a second. I'm like, that's gotta that's gotta roll off the tongue better somehow. You spell it as M I K A E L, and this is what he looks like. He's a follower of Christ, I see. Yeah. He was the architect of Rome. He goes to Rome and decides, I am going to be the guy who is going to copy the Bruja's homework, and I'm going to do Athens, but better. So he designs what Rome is going to look like. And it's this perfect city. It's this marvelous city. 
there was nothing like Rome at the time. He works his ass off, and him and the Toreador build Rome, and it's beautiful, and it's fantastic, and this is the city that will be the center of civilization. People will look at this city and cry tears of joy, knowing they get to live in such a beautiful place, as long as they bend the heel to me and do what I say, right? Of course, as it was back in the day. As it turns out, he had a little bit of a god complex, Michael, uh, this Michael guy. And after Rome is built, the Venturi walk over and say, um, hey, we just lost Sparta. Uh, you guys got a pretty cool thing going on here with Rome. Um, could we have a little piece of that? And the Venturi move in, and it turns out the Toreador can do politics, but the Venturi just do it better. And they look at this and say, oh, we've got a fantastic economy. We've got a great military. We've got an entire uh, Senate system and court system uh, better than it was in Athens. I mean, you, you did, did you copy the Bruja too? And the Venture said, uh, no, it's um, talent. That's why we're so good at this. And thus begins the beautiful relationship between Toreador and Venture. That, ho that hollow notes uh, analogy I did, uh, this is their oats, the Venture. Yes. Where every, uh, when we eventually do the Venture episode, every accomplishment the Venture have, they have it alongside the Toreador. Wherever the Venture go, the Toreador will always follow. They are attached at the hip. I can't think of a single vampire clan that gets along as well as the Venture and Toreador do. It is because... honestly kind of heartwarming in all honesty. Yeah, these guys, th these guys are like truly inseparable. And, of course, their combined efforts, Rome is the place to be. Um, gladiator living is life for me. <laughs> yes, it is. And a, what? Yes, it is, but it's in the sun, so you're going to have to, you can't see it very well. Yeah, so, so the, it's cool, they have it, so they can't really see it, but, you know, people like it, and Michael says, as long as somebody's enjoying it, uh, that's good enough for me. Uh Michael's like kind of like a good guy, but like a bad guy at the same time. And behold, we now have Rome. And, um, ooh, who's that knock on my door? It sounds like a third clan wants to join us, and it's the Malkavians. Um, Venture, what do we do here? Um, my, my, um, our Crazy mother's brothers, brothers here. yeah, our, our mother's brother's sons are here at the door. Do we let them in? And the Venture look and say, um, they look a little crazy. Let's see what they have to say first. They start talking with the Toreador. Uh, the Toreador and the Ventures talk with the Malkavians. And as it turns out, the Malkavians know a lot of information. A lot of stuff that they're not supposed to know. And they start saying, you got an issue. You see all the way over across the ocean, you've got this place called Carthage. That's being built by the Bruja. They're making plans to kill you. They're teaming up with the Bali to do so. You gotta do something about that. And they say, well, um, thank you, Malkavians. You're in. So they pull the Malkavians, they pull them into Rome, and now you've got, at the time, the three strongest political clans all working together. Yeah, they were forced to be reckoned with, and hence built the Western, uh, the foundations of Western civilization. Yes, and all the Europeans said, thank you for destroying my culture, and so I get to live in Europe today. <laughs> <laughs> what have the Romans ever done for us? Uh, what they did is that they destroyed all archives of people they went to war with. So, uh, behold, you only get the good stories. Well, they they wanted to make they wanted to leave us a greatest hits compilation and called it the Rise and Fall of Rome in six yeah, volumes. Yeah, war warfare is awesome. <laughs> and who do we have in the Punic Wars? We have. Rome versus Carthage. So the Toreador keep, um, they stay at home and just make sure that Rome isn't going to fall while the Ventru and the Malkavians are going to war. And as we know with the story, Carthage falls and Troil, who we thought at the time was the Bruja Antiluvian, dies in the war. So, uh, cool, right? Yeah, pretty good. Good chat. And the Bruja have their dreams completely crushed and the Ventru and Malkavian spit in their faces they kill every single Bali there including Moloch one of the three original Bali so even better right yes you're actually doing good things 
you know, accomplish something that the Asimites tried doing for centuries, for millennia, and you succeeded, but they failed. And everything looks great until the worm gets involved. Yeah, something had to go wrong. And as it turns out, Rome's doing just a little too well. It's doing just a little too well. So the worm sneaks into Rome and begins to corrupt the Ventru specifically. The Toreador knows something's wrong. The Malkavians know something is wrong. But the Malkavians, while trying to figure out the nature of the worm, become even more insane and begin to lose track of their own investigation. The Toreador quickly get the hell out of there. They look at the Ventru, they say, I think we need some time apart. And they split, causing the separation between the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. The Toreador were the Byzantines in this situation. Yeah. They're like, we need a new place to go make art where there's not crazy shit going on. And as we know, Rome would eventually collapse and rebuild as the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and then collapse and bounce back again with um, the separation between them and Constantinople. And uh, who's in Constantinople around this time? Well, the Asimites, a little scary that they're around, and the La Sombra come into the picture. And the La Sombra say, Hey, you, you, you burned about the Ventru? Um, we can do what they can better than they can. And the Torador start a little relationship with the La Sombra before the Ventru slide back in and say, uh, Hey, we're back. And they immediately dump the La Sombra and get back into bed with the Ventru. Well, that was fast. <laughs> just like they're just like they're uh just like they're antediluvian. You're cursed to forever play second fiddle. Yup. See, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm always number two. I am Knuff. That's it, it's it's never gonna be Knuff with with the little sombra. They'll no, never there's that cl that clan wide inferiority complex. That's why you that's why you have their antediluvian sitting in the Mariana trench listening to fucking you know, my chemical romance all for eternity. He's got Lincoln Park on loop. Yeah. I become so numb. <laughs> and he's just sitting there in a pool of lava and like, I just can't anymore. See, La Sombra, we have explained to you, you are immortal. You cannot die. It's like, hey, you gonna come out there and help lead your clan? No. The fucking Zumichi ruined everything. This is me, she ruined everything. The toy door dumped me. The venture keeps stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, find, man. It's why you find La Sombra on, like, the brain cell subreddit. Yes. <laughs> All right. I, I believe that clan coined the term black pill, too. I mean, yeah, with, with uh, a tenebration, absolutely. <laughs> So we have the Byzantine Empire, and all is pretty well here, right? But, uh, of course, good things have to come to an end. Uh, one Great Schism, one Crusade, uh, one Bruja. You made the massive fucking mistake of bringing the Bruja in. And now the entire town is beginning to collapse. Mika, uh, Michael, the guy who's still alive, looks and begins to realize, I made a massive mistake trying to run this place. I started my own cult called the Nephilim, where I tried pretending I was the Archangel Michael, and I tried getting people that uh, tried getting people to think that I was some sort of messiah who's going to come down and save them from all the things that were threatening the Byzantine Empire. Instead, I got in the way of God, who now I'm realizing is the one true God, and I shouldn't have gotten in the way of that. And my failure to keep a safe city has brought in the Bali, who are fighting the Asimites again, and, second, the Setites. They have snuck into the Byzantine Empire, they're selling drugs, they're selling children, and now the entire city is beginning to crumble on, under its own weight because Michael let it grow too big. So, what Michael does is that he brings in three vampires. One from... If I'm remembering this right, one La Sombra, one Bruja, I think, and one Bali. The Bali in question might not be a Bali, it might be a Setite. Black Mary, aka Black Magdalena, aka the Church of Black Magdalena, who are the Setite women who believe that um, having sex with children is doing them a good thing because you're freeing them from the taboos of society. 
Uh, as the, with any victim of any you know teacher that's ever fucked a kid, no, that's that's not how that works. That's not how that works at all. And uh, it's Michael's fault the, uh, that that cult got uh, that that cult formed because he hosted the venue for the Church of Black Magdalena. Oh, it had church in the name. It had to be good. So he asked Black Magdalena to kill him. He says, you are my biggest mistake. I should have killed you instead of let you into the city. So finish the job and kill me. And Black Magdalena does. I mean, I don't know what he expected. Uh, well, he wanted to die. That's, th that's why he did that. That's fair. Instead of cleaning up your and, mistakes, you decide to just say, fuck it. Yeah, this guy reminds me of Fulgrim, come to think of it, from uh, 40k. I have not you know, 40k. <laughs> yeah, his, his whole story is like, I killed Ferris Manus, and instead of owning up for my mistake, I'm going to let a demon possess me so I can escape my own responsibility. As it goes. And next up, we have the Byzantine Empire collapses, everybody flees the wind, the Asamites grab the land and turn it into the Ottoman Empire. And where did the Toreador end up? Um, back in Italy, because things just begin to smooth over there. We now have the, man the many, many kingdoms of Italy. On top of that, they just really liked Italy. And oh, there's Rome, it's still standing. Let's go back to it. But there's a couple of Toreador that end up in Africa instead. And now we get to talk about the African Toreador. All right. Now these guys. Uh, by the way, that um, that cult that Michael started, it's known as the Nephilim. That's what it's known as. Yes. And it's a that church still exists, and there are a group that believes that Michael is an angel that's eventually going to come back and save them. When no, that's not going to happen. No, 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 See, it is not. The Africa that they end up in is North Africa. So you get the Rayin al Fin, who are the Arabic Toreador who live in Egypt and Persia. I mean, that's kind of neat. And, and the thing about them is that, first of all, Egypt is pretty cool. You got the pyramids, you got the Sphinx, you got the Luxor, the Library all of this Alexandria. awesome architecture. Yeah, like, why, why did we not come here before? This place is awesome. And they made peace with the Asamites, and along with them, formed the Ashira, the Islamic version of the Camarilla. Oh, that's actually really cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah. there's a fourth faction known as the Ashira. As of 5th edition, they disbanded. But, you know, that's because um, Justin Gicchilli is too chicken shit to rap about Islam. But, um, <laughs> but they... they uh, they're a group of Bruja, Banu Hakim, La Sombra, Nosferatu, and Toreador. And it's the the one group where you'll see Nosferatu and Toreador getting along. That's because they're together under Allah. Yeah, it's uh, this is why you need religion in your life, so you can find a, a natural unifying community and not your secular bullshit where you're all debating and trying to out-intellectual each other. This is why I stopped being intellectual and decided to just, you know, give everyone a beer. This is this is why I don't give a fuck when a Reddit atheist gets in my face because I'm I. You're not a logical person, so I don't need to be logical with you. I am a child you. of God. I have See. faith in my <laughs> origins. See, um, what happens in the Middle Ages? Uh, the Renaissance. Yeah, we go back to Fun Italy, and everything's hot. cool now. Fun time with Sapphire All, and then another Torridor comes to the picture. We call him Raphael, who is the painter Raphael. Yes, the first of the Ninja Turtles. He is uh, known here as Raphael de Corazon, who was a struggling artist trying to get work in the cathedrals. When he decides that the best way he's going to get work is by stealing the drafts and sketches of other people, and putting a spin on them. As for what that spin is, he is taking scenes from the Bible and turning them into pornographic scenes. <laughs> so, his uh, portfolio includes um, this like massive ceiling painting of Adam having sex with Eve. And he uses that to get into the church, and it works. And all the priests would like sit beneath the, um, beneath the ceiling and like jerk off and jizz on their robes. <laughs> and that's how he got his money. He was the 
<laughs> he was the Hugh Hefner <laughs> of the Renaissance. He was. And he ends up getting embraced by Callisti Y Castillo, who was a very horny venture woman who liked the kind of pornography he made until it turns out, no, that actually wasn't his. She goes to kill him, but then Raphael says, behold, thievery is a form of art. And through this like complete bullshit argument that he himself doesn't believe in, he convinces her not to kill him and then uses her status to move up further and further and further into Clan Toreador until eventually, in 1313, when the Convention of Thorns takes place and the Camarilla forms, while well, she's off in India having like this like massive sex um, sex vacation, he's going in her place, and he rules lawyers and Socrates the entire time. He is this devil's advocate who won't stop saying why, why, why all the time, and it gets to a point where he gets thrown out by the Ventru until the Ventru realizes, wait, no, he actually has some good ideas, bring him back in, and he, along with Atreus end up becoming the guys who signed the Camarilla into existence. So he was yep. a founding Small member. Small beginnings, right? Yeah. Small beginnings. <laughs> yeah. Started out drawing cock, and next thing you know, you're slamming your big dick on the table. I think the Venture who signed along with that was Hardstat the Eldest, but I'm not sure about saying that. Um... And then Hardset Eldest will eventually die and then become replaced with Hardset Younger, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the Ventru. Let's see. I, I think I've told you before that Jan Peter Zoon is my favorite lore character, so when we talk about the Venture, I'm going to be very happy. He was supposed to be in the Werewolf campaign at some point if we went down a certain yeah. path, but I don't believe we went down I mean, that path. And he path. still is, but he's just off camera. Yes, he is. Sitting in his tower yeah, in New York like, huh, shit's getting kind of fucked down there. You blew up half the damn city. I gotta get out of here. That was not my goddamn fault, first of all. <laughs> Next up is the Napoleonic Age. You remember Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Uh, it's around this time that the Torador began to realize, hey, uh, human politics is pretty stupid. Uh, you just killed the king and replaced him with this uh, teeny tiny guy. And then he fights for 20 years, gets overthrown and exiled. He comes back, has this massive war, dies again only for the exact same monarchical family to take back over. And this is all a massive waste of time. We're done playing with politics. We're done. Uh, this is the Ventures Wheelhouse now. We're, we're done. Uh, hey, Napoleon was actually average height for the time. Yeah, a average height for the time. Uh, that, that For the time being the, the key emphasis here. Yes. And they start saying, well, this kind of sucks. We're done playing with politics. We're just going to leave that to the Ventru. We are instead... Well, actually, we don't have anything left to accomplish. So the Toreador, as a clan, collectively retire and go to doing what they always want to do, make art and collect art. And basically, and, just um, they, they threw all their paperwork in the air. It's like, bored now, going home. And really, we could just end, uh, we could just end, end the history there because that, that really is where they step out. Like, first and second edition, the accomplishments completely stop at 1800. I mean, yeah, and then they decide to start, you know, doing everything. Does this mean Lou Reed is a Toreador? Yes. Okay, you know what? Yeah, that explains a lot. That's how he survived heroin. I mean, uh, you, we have Rich Cross Berlin as a book. You don't say. So we can have an entire comic book in Berlin if you want. I mean, I I was thinking the other day of playing a get ephemeris Galliard, who was basically just um, he was basically just Till Lindemann. I I got to play a game that took place in Berlin. I got to play as a Cappadocian for that game. That sounds like fun. That was a that was a Middle Ages game, which is why I was allowed to be the Cappadocian. Oh, okay, fair. Yeah, and yeah, once again, when we talk about uh, the Cappadocians, that will be another day where I'm very happy. Yeah, we'll we'll get there at some point. And looking at everything there, I think Berlin today is run by a Toreador. Let me be absolutely sure. If Hardstat the if Hardstat's name pops up in this, there is there. a lot of art that goes on in Berlin, so that makes sense. 
Now that's the Who that's the interesting the... thing about that. Like during the during the Cold War, does that mean there were like two competing vampire fa- or was it the Silver fa- or no the Shadow Lords in the Eastern Bloc of Berlin? While yes. the while like the the vampires were in hiding, the Toreador were in hiding in uh, West Berlin. Yes, that would be a fucking fantastic game. It's the Venture who run Berlin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But even still, like, yeah, th- think about it. That'd be that'd be a kind of really fucking cool. Like maybe just like a short campaign, like the fall of the Soviet Union, and the vampires have to escape. Before the uh, before the Shadow Lords kill them all, or vice versa, I don't know. It'd be really cool. Uh, yeah, along with the like Tunnel Twenty Two, trying to build a wall, a uh, tunnel between West and East uh, Berlin. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be really neat. Yeah, you you have a lot of stuff that can take place in this spot because it, it's a very historical city. It is. I I would love to go to Germany one day. I can actually speak we, some we, German. We could do the head fig in the edge and the angry inch campaign. <laughs> that's a stupid idea (laughs) sometimes dumb ideas are the best ones I I told you that I thought that movie was like fucking freaky because there's like a whole scene in it dedicated to child grooming uh, yeah that that was kind of like me watching the end of uh, American Beauty like the part where like uh, Kevin Spacey's daughter's friend is like coming on to him like I, I just had to straight up skip that part I couldn't watch that yeah, okay. uh, thankfully, th- thankfully he stops because he realizes like, what he's doing is wrong in the middle of it. Wow! If only he applied that to real fucking life. Good lord. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Spacey not practicing what he preaches. It, no, absolutely not. I hate to, I hate to know what Ed Slelgort went through during the shooting of Baby Driver. Yeah. Anyway. Oh. And now we get to talk about Toy Door culture, where it turns out there's one thing. They like more than anything else. Art. Art. Yes, they freaking love art. There is a whole chapter in the book dedicated to the kind of art they make, uh, otherwise known as playing the Toreador. So it's really interesting because it's like a three-part... Um, it's a three-part skill challenge uh, when it comes to the Toreador and their pursuit of creating art... The storyteller, it the, you know, the Toreador actually gets a stat on their skill sheet, which no other vampire has. That is creativity. The storyteller rolls that in secret, which is left entirely to chance. That is, you roll one die and then subtract three. If the score comes up as zero or less, then you get a score of zero. And whenever you need to create a work of art, you need to roll your intelligence plus a creativity in order to develop the concept. And the storyteller has the option to keep the dice roll secret, and the player has to describe what sort of uh, art piece they're creating, be it, you know, a painting, a writing, you know, music, dance, whatever it is. And there's a set of, there's a list that I'm going to go through of, you know, the number of successes uh, determining the originality of the work. First is a botch. The concept is so simple you are amazed no one has thought of it before. You are truly brilliant, but everyone else will see you for the fool you are. No successes. Well, and then your own farts. Yes. No successes <laughs> is you have to try again because it's a dumb idea. One to two, it's derivative, but some people might like it. Three to four, new concepts, nothing outstanding. Maybe that's why nobody's done it yet. Five successes, pretty neat. Six successes, everyone will wonder where you get your ideas. And seven this just might be a masterpiece. After you th- come up with the concept, you f- then have to execute. And in order to do so, it depends on, again, what sort of work of art that you're uh, trying to create. It's going to be dexterity, charisma, manipulation, intelligence, or wits at the storyteller's discretion, plus expression against a difficulty equal to the complexity of the work. Which, de- which was decided on the uh, previous page. A botch is you might think it's a masterpiece and everyone else will laugh at you, a.k.a. the car that Homer built. Uh, zero successes, <laughs> start over, it sucks. One to two, it's all right, but only a few people really like it. Three to four, pretty good, but nothing t- uh, incredible. Five, above average. Six, outstanding. Seven, 
If it was a brilliant idea, it is a masterpiece. That is a very hard rule to get. First, you would need to have just an incredible creative creativity score or just like a flash in the pan of brilliance when it comes to your intelligence role um, in order to determine... You need uh, Ham to roll this. Yes. Ham historically <laughs> rules fucking incredibly. I'm going to... Seven successes while fighting Gruslan. <laughs> God bless him. Really. Yeah, I think that holy sword hits him. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and then with that, uh, your brilliant work becomes a masterpiece in the afterwork of that. And then when it comes to... There's also another one when it comes to critiquing the work itself. Uh, critiquing re role requires perception and art uh, well, art appreciation. I don't know if that's a stat uh, specific to first edition or not. Um, at I think it is. Yeah, at difficulty seven. And there's another chart for this. The botch is you utterly condemn a masterpiece or you praise a piece of crap. Basically, you're the Rolling Stone magazine talking about uh, Be Here Now by Oasis for the first time. Uh, zero yeah. successes. You have no clue because you just don't get it. One to two, you know within a range of two successes, whether it's high or low, the originality and the quality of the work, determined by the earlier charts. Three to four, you know within a range of one success, high or low, the originality and quality. Five success, you know exactly how original and how good it is. Six, same as five, but you have an amazing insight into its creation. Seven is the same as six, but you can add insight even the artist might have missed. Uh, <laughs> I like this little section at the end. All the information presented in this section is totally useless unless a storyteller plays up the Toreador attraction to the art. Storytellers should not limit themselves to the mechanics explained here. Feel free to alter any of the rules to make the game more realistic and enjoyable. That's one of the things I really like about this clan is that because it's all about art and creating things and having humanity in a world that otherwise wouldn't have any... It allows you to add a lot of flavor and flair to an otherwise bland game. So even though it might be well suited to have to being a beginner clan, it to somebody that knows what they're doing and gets extraordinarily lucky on their roles, this could honestly add a huge amount of flavor to the campaign. Because when you look at a vampire game that we did, who was the most human out of all of us? Definitely Tabitha. Absolutely. Where that's the other thing we'll get into is the sex, but at the same time, Tabitha was a model. Um, specifically cosplay is what she would do. So pretty much what your um what your sister does is a job. Well not really as a job, but she she does it as a hobby. But yeah, so Tabitha was a well known, you know, cosplayer slash influencer. See also the uh idol of millions, um where is it? The Idol of Millions yes. archetype, in uh, as outlined in First Edition. Yeah, she had a shitload of fame in her background. <laughs> Was a very easy way to get fed. A very easy way to get fed. Along with that, she had the OnlyFans account, so she started getting like a ton of money too. Rolling in the dough because the game was set in 2020 during COVID, and it was the great nudening of that time. Along with that, she had our. Um, her Chinese American childer, uh, Finua Zaihong, who and Finua was a sweetheart. God bless her. Yep. Uh, we never really did know if it was a guy or a girl. No, but you know what? We live in an enlightened era, so it was cool. And also, Finua helped in combat and wasn't a complete fucking coward like that fraud Anita. Yeah. <laughs> Some people just can't hack in vampire society. Yeah, and she couldn't. That's why she was a spy, but she was a fucking terrible spy. Well, actually, no, she was a very effective spy, but just a coward. Yeah, the, the minute she gets involved in close quarters combat, she she knows she can't win. You're a gangle for Christ's sake. Suck up. <laughs> and the other thing about the Torador, the sex. They love the dirty, sex. Dirty sex. Yeah, their Torador will embrace three people. Artists who make very pretty stuff, um, simps who give them enough money and are devoted to them enough, or people that can give them sex that makes them feel like they're human again. Where 
that's something they want. They want to feel human. The Toreador want to do that. And what's more human than procreation? I it I, I need to have like a scene of like Tabitha shows up when Freddy gets his body back, and Colt has to like hold him back. It's like, no, no, absolutely not, no. <laughs> Why? She's hot! Yeah, call... You just got your fucking buddy back. You you will not survive it. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turns out with the with the sex, like we said with the King Meta story, they will typically hook up with somebody for a night, and then if it's not good enough, they're gone, they ghost. Uh, if it's good enough, they'll stay with them for as long as the sex is good, or until someone else who's just as pretty or prettier pops up in their life, and then they immediately leave the person they were dating. And if you get... It, so it's basically you either are a Midas or a Prius. Yeah. Now, but unless... Um, if you're a Prius, where you are somebody that the Toreador was in love with during the time that they got embraced, where if you encounter a Toreador like that, that's the way that is the rare one and only Toreador. They will cling to you like nothing else, and that is a companion you will have until the day you both reach final death. If you die before the Toreador does, they will never get over you. Cause he makes you feel alive. Where we, we saw that with Tabitha in our vampire game where when Fenua got captured by the La Sombra, she did whatever it took to get them back. Yes, she she legitimately loved Fenua and was actually very sweet. Yeah. And looking at what else they have, I think that's it, really. Like that, that's Those are the only two things you really need to do with the Torador. Yes, you need to have loads of sex and make loads of art, or buy loads of art. Now, we did say that there are Kimberly in Ashira. I think there's only, I think that makes up 2% of the Torador. The Toreador are a very numerous clan, by the way. This is this is the the clan that has the most active members in it. Well, yes, because, because they're a... smart. Yeah, yeah they're just smart. Well, they're smart, and they have a lot of sex with a lot of people. Compare that to the Bruja that embrace on an almost industrial scale, and the Gangrel who will just embrace whoever comes into the woods. The Toreador play it smart and know how to stay alive and how to pretend to be human and tend to live a lot longer than any other vampire can. You look at the list of Toreador named characters, a lot of them, a lot of them, are G4, G5, and G6s. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a section in the book, actually, that's all about like living the double life as a Toreador. I'll, I'll bring up the page for it if I can find it. Where did I put it? Yeah, yeah. Uh... yeah because, because Eric Hill was the only semi-decent person besides yeah, Solot, um... Besides Solat and was there any other good guy in Toluvians out there? Really? Um, no, there really isn't. Probably, I mean, Anoya like, maybe, but Ravnos. Ra Ra um, Ravnos wasn't necessarily good, but he wasn't evil either. And I, I guess if you're Muslim, Hakim. Yes. Um, but yeah, like it but, says here, the start yeah. of chapter two. Uh, you know, living for your work, playing the mortal is a big part of being a Toreador. Where, once again, a lot of Toreador will follow the path of humanity, which is outlawed by the Camarilla, but they still follow it anyway because they know they knew about Golconda. They didn't really buy into the Tremere propaganda about the uh, Salubri being soul sealers. They don't believe that, mm -hmm. but they went along with it anyway because the Tremere had already kissed up to the Venture, and the Venture wanted to keep the Tremere around. So they know the truth about the Salubri. And they see this as the closest thing they can get to Golconda. So a lot of them will follow the path of Fianti to keep their beast as far away from them as possible. So it, it was kind of great that I picked to play Ventru when we decided to do a uh, Vampire Kiwami. Yeah, because uh, wherever, Tori do, uh, wherever the Tori door go, a Ventru is along with them. Yes, so that actually worked very well. We basically just had a drunk-ass Bruja bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, what else? Ah, uh, ah! Uh, think, damn it! What was I gonna say? Uh the uh the Torador. When it comes to factions, two percent of them are with the Ashira. Ninety-seven percent of all Torador are with the Camarilla. What would it take for a Torador to want to go to the Sabbat? 
they don't want to go to the Sabbat. They don't want to go to the Anarchs either. They don't, um, the Inkanu, the Toriador that make up the Inkanu, are born into the Inkanu, and that's not even a percent of Toriador. That's not even 1% of Toriador. The only way that the Toriador will wind up in the Sabbat or in the Anarchs is if they completely fuck up every avenue possible with the Camarilla to the point where they have the Sheriff or a Blood Hunt sent after them. Then and only then will they join the Sabbat or the Anarchs, and they're doing it against their will. Yeah, then they don't have a choice, but, you know, that's that's a rare occurrence, I imagine, because Toreador yeah. will want to keep their comfy life as comfy as possible. And on top of that, you need to seriously mess up if you're if you're going to get kicked out of the Camarilla as a Toreador, because the Ventru really like you and will tend to keep you around as long as possible. It's like, the guy at work who doesn't seem to do that much, but the boss really likes them for whatever reason and just refuses to fire them. You would quite literally have to walk a Garrow unknowingly into an Elysium to get kicked out. Yeah, well, while, while he's in Frenzy. Yes. that That is the only way as a Torridor you would get kicked out of the Camarilla. I'm sure there's others, and... but like, you'd have to fuck up majorly. And when it comes to the Camarilla, I mean, the Camarilla have money, the Camarilla have a lot of history, they have their shit together. The Ventru stick with the Camarilla. You've got the Malkavians, uh, who are your security when it comes to information warfare. You've got the Nosferatu, keeping the underground um, under check. You've got the Bruja, which make up your sheriffs and your blood hunters. The Gangrel, uh, I guess they do something. And then the Tremere. If things go sour, the Tremere are there to back you up. So uh, why would I ever willingly leave the Camarilla when I got a package this good? Exactly. That that does kind of... Rem it's a bit off topic. Why are there Gangrel in the Camarilla in the first place? It's because the Ventru thought it was a good idea to bring them in. Because these are guys that live out in the woods. So they can keep an eye on stuff that hangs out in the woods. Like, I don't know, the, the Sinichi and the werewolves. Yes. that Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. The, the Gangrel kind of, sort of, are their own thing. Like, technically, there's only six groups in the Camarilla, and the Gangrel have been, like, off and on, off and on, off and on for years. We kind of drift, because, like, we don't want none of that. We'd rather be out in the woods with the fresh air and all the fresh blood. Yeah, you, you guys are like furries IRL, but, like, you actually believe your animals and you have the power to become them. Look, I'm trying my best not to, but I do like hunting. It's quite, it's quite relaxing. See, what it feels like to shift... <laughs> no, I, I'd not get that far, and I hope not to. My wife would, my wife would kill me. Well, that um, <laughs> your wife would kill you. Yes, uh, she almost yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, that was rough. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so next up is the relationships, where we can mostly blitz through this. We don't have much in terms of pages because once again, that second edition copy got fucked up through yes. whatever means. Uh, so. Johnny had to go through and quick fire me off some notes. So we'll start from the top. The Tremere. Yeah, feel, feel free to paraphrase. Yes. So the Tremere are just fucking nerds. They're nerds with way too much power that, that they should be useful for. But they kind of fucked themselves up working just for the Camarilla. So why would they ever betray them? They're really hard to seduce because they're neats and they don't go outside. Do not bloodbind them. The you know, the Tremere are technically higher on the totem pole than the Toreador, so an elder is likely to kill you for that. Very simple. That, But the Tremere, it's like um, the quiet kid meme. When, yes. Whenever they look at, whenever the Toreador look at the Tremere, they, they think, like, why don't we just kick these guys out of the Camarilla? And it's because whenever they start looking at the Tremere, they start hearing pumped up kicks playing in the back of their head. Yeah, that's why. And they, they, don't, realize, they don't fuck um, around with them because they can't. Yeah, m maybe we should leave this guy alone. <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of the Malkavians, despite uh, despite them technically being sibling clans, uh, due to their lineage, they scare the shit out of the Toreador. They are vital to the Camarilla's success because of how much they know, but they never want to talk to them because of how scary they are. Just don't talk to them ever if you can avoid it. If a Mal as it says, if a Malkavian becomes a Camarilla prince, those will be the worst years of your life. Your life will suck. 
When Malkavians do eventually go down, they will pull a lot of other vampires with them, especially if you're Toreador. So stay away from the Malkavians if you can. Uh, the After F- all, they, they, yeah. see, they, they see them as like um, this group of like psychotic weirdos who are almost like a virus in a way, where uh, they're insane, they have the power to make other people insane, so we de- we need to stay away from them before they say something to us and use demonization with them without them knowing. And why would you want to hang around these guys? Because like the average conversation with them. Hang on, let me get this right up to my microphone. Is the lowest level, other than the chaos gods that the Greeks first wrote about. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's like, don't talk to these guys. They're creepy. I was like, in before Zemichi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, the Asimites. Uh, fuck the Asimites. They killed Mozart. He wrote good music. Fuck them. Yeah, uh, it, they yeah, are... That's actually like a little like funny tidbit in the lore. Like, yeah, the Asimites actually were behind that. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. They are reverse Tremere. They're thugs who actually, you know... Got the money from the CIA to kill people. Um, they're easy to shoo away with bribes and money and blood. Uh, it'd be really funny to throw an Asimite at a Tremere and watch them fight. Do not ever, under any circumstances, go near one to make a deal. They're scary. Don't go to the Asimites. The Bruja. They make or fantastic assassins. The Toreador love paying the Asmites to solve problems for them. And in 5th edition, it's the Toreador that um, sponsor the uh, the Banu Hakim to join the Camarilla because of all the work they've done in the past. But if you ever want to sign a deal with these guys, send their proxy because these guys love to diabolize and they would love to diabolize you. Yes, your blood tastes like honey to them. Anyway. Great. I'm put this on my flapjacks. Yes, Bruja. Uh, <laughs> they were really smart. They made Carthage, and then they helped us with the uh, with you know Byzantine, and now they're just NPCs that fight each other. Uh, basically, just show a Bruja your tits, and you're good. Except they make really shitty boyfriends. Uh, but if a Bruja has been around for long enough, like my boy Ragnar, you might actually might find a real companion with him. I don't. I don't care that the man is like a cuck who like lives in Lindsay Ellis's basement. We both watched Todd into the Shadows. Yes. And you remember the episode they did about um, Arrested Development? Yes, I do. Where what I mean by shitty boyfriends is that the the song they have warm sentiments where it's um speech talking about his girlfriend getting an abortion at length and. The way he talks in the song, it sounds like this is a guy that cares a lot about his feelings. But not so much about yours. That's what it's like to Dea Bruja. Basically, yes. Yeah. But yeah, like... we're going to talk about how much um, I would benefit under communism. I don't care about what happens to you because I'm on my own little Soviet fantasy, where I will live in my perfect world, but you will live in my perfect world, and I don't really care about what happens to you. This is why you need to make friends with old Bruja because they're actually principled individuals. Yeah, they say, like, you guys used to be geniuses. You guys were the philosopher kings of Athens. You were such brilliant minds, and look what you are now. I am of the idea that communism in the world of darkness is just one giant slab of worm taint. They, they had looked at that. Well, actually, no, that's, that, that's the technocrats that made that idea. And they, they made it knowing it was going to fail, and it was just going to be um, bourgeoisie dictatorship under a different name. Yeah, that that's about right. But the Bruja bought into it like a fucking idiot. Yeah, uh, wait for when we talk about mage. We get to talk about the New World Order. Ah, uh, I'm gonna. My blood's gonna fucking boil during that. So, uh, yes. the Sedites. <laughs> they're the to- the Toridor are the Sedites' best customers. Uh huh. <laughs> they're incredible <laughs> treasure hunters, and they hire them to steal shit that you want to buy because you can't afford it because you spend all your money on somebody other Toridor's only fans. The Toreador are very aware of set, but they think it's a bunch of bullshit, because if some of you remember Vampire Kiwami, the Camarilla don't really believe in the whole antediluvian shtick. Uh, The Toreador are just too disinterested in Ascension to be corrupted by them, 
They just kind of have sex, buy the drugs, buy the sex slaves, and then tell them to fuck off. Uh, typically, when a when a torador like in the event they buy a child from a setite, they're not buying the child because they're pedophiles. They're buying it because that's a child slave who's eventually going to grow up in vampire society and grow up to be a loyal soldier who will eventually become one of the best schools I've ever had in my life. That's honestly, that would honestly be like a kind of a neat story as well. It's like, yes, I saved you from a lifetime of trauma and servitude. Now, please get me a glass of wine. There it is. <laughs> It'd be a very, <laughs> it's a very fucked, but kind of bittersweet, but really messed up story. But that would be a great story. You go from one cage to another. And eventually that if you get sired, you could have a better life than the guy who purchased you. D holy shit that's a fucking brilliant idea like there we go that's a, a fucking a, a fucking kid that grows up as you know a living child of a tori or she eventually embraces him and then he uses his influence to take revenge on the Sedite who bought him in the first place that'd be a fucking incredible story keep this in mind for your vampire dark ages games and your vampire games that have characters that are from the middle ages in modern day that's fucking incredible that's a great idea okay moving on i'm sorry um the gangrel uh they're, they're, <laughs> yeah they're terrible guests they're you know they smell like shit uh but it would be nice um to team up with camarilla to kick them out of the camarilla uh, and they're kind of fucking useless, except they're not. Because, you know, there's a lot of shit that's out in the wild that's a lot scarier than everything else in the Camarilla. So they're, so they're they, useful, but they don't think they're useful. They don't know what they're talking about because the Toreador don't ever leave the cities. Um, one more thing. This reminds me of, um, who's it? John Favreau, uh, when he's doing his Lion King 2019 um, commentary, he's saying... Uh, that that shot's a little too pretty to actually exist in Africa. There, there's nothing actually that pretty in the African savanna. It's like, uh, yeah, you would know this because you live in L.A., one of the biggest shitholes on Earth. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, dude, it, it's yeah. kind of funny because, like, I remember during like the the one scene where like we were all like having a team bonding, we were bowling. Cole just decides to go to his old soldier instinct, like check on everybody, make sure everybody's doing all right. Goes over to Tabitha and Finua, talks to them as like. Look, I get it. You're not used to the regulars of combat. If anything goes wrong, stand behind me. You'll be all right. And well, they got fortitude. Yeah, yeah. That's basically what happens. Just like it, it, it would it, also it, be nice to have like that kind of moment with a gang rule. It's like, yeah, we get it. You're up there in your ivory tower. You're standing behind us for a reason. There is one moment with uh, Toradoran Doran gang rule that's in um. The, uh, the Beckett books. Um, I think it's what the novelized version of the Transylvania Chronicles, where Beckett, um, the main character who is a gangrel, uh, you remember Helena? He ends up in her in her haven, and she uses presence on him, and almost forces him into sex slavery. In the middle of that scene. Really? Yeah, and as part of that scene, because she's so powerful with presence. She commands Beckett to eat his own fingernails off his fingers, and he does it. Oh, somebody didn't spec enough into fortitude, obviously. Yeah, there it goes. Or somebody spec a little bit too much into potence. I spec into fortitude because I was walking around with nose in me. I didn't like that fat bastard. They end up saving you because how many times did you almost die in that game? Quite a few, actually. <laughs> <laughs> It really started when the fucking, um, when the antenna cut me in half. That was rough. See, uh, twist your arcs, Corn. It's a little uh, buzzy. Yeah, sorry. My, my cord's kind of, I bought this cord, like, not too long ago. Why is it fucking up with me? Anyway. Um. Oh, wireless. Who's next? The Giovanni. They're gross. It's a coin toss in killing them because they just might come back as ghosts and haunt you. They try way too hard to look impressive. And they're incestuous, and they're necrophiles, but they're too dangerous to just wipe out entirely because they have so many zombies. They're they, just they, gross. They always want like trying to impress you 
with with the pasta dinner. They say, "Hey, it's got I got my Mozman nut on it. It's very good. I give you a, a pastrami sandwich too." Hey. And the Toreador looking at it saying, "I was in Rome, way ba back in the days of the Roman Empire, and I had food better than this. <laughs> I had I had flour gruel better than this shit." Do not tell me about the Italians cooking with uh, tomatoes, because I was in Naples when the tomato plants first arrived. Who was the Who was the one character in The Sopranos that hated sandwiches when like everyone else was just like, if you wanted to get a deal, you had like a chicken parm sandwich with you? Yeah, I'm pulling up like I'm typing in uh, Sopranos sandwich hater. I'm trying to remember who it was. I can't, I watched a video about it the I other day. What, was it Harris? It might have been Harris. I I don't remember. But uh, we'll we'll say it's him. I I think so. I'll I'll uh, Sean will probably yell at me in a couple of days that it was somebody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, La Sombra. The La Sombra are very worthy opponents who need to stop the whole Angels of Death shtick. If you, any of you remember the La Sombra video, we've been over that. The Toreador will sponsor the Sombra who defect from the Sabat to get into the Camarilla. They are incredibly dangerous to fight. As we found out with Ruslan, that Tenebration is a fucking monster. Uh, like what they did, they liked their whole cool thing about taking over the world with the church, but they aren't as smart or manipulative as they think they are because the Venture can do it better. So, uh, it could have been the Sombra, like in a different timeline. It could have been the La Sombra in the place of the Ventru, and the Toreador were clinging onto their arms, but the Ventru got to them first, and now we live in the world that we live in. Basically, yes. Uh, meanwhile, the Nosferatu. Fuck the Nosferatu. The Nosferatu hate them, and we hate the Nosferatu. I mean, you, th they say they're like, oh, great spies, but who needs them when you have Auspex and all of these simps and ghouls and shit? Um... They will organize the assassination of the Nosferatu that knows too much. Uh, but they believe that Nosferatu are all conspiring to destroy the Camarilla and take it over from within, which they probably can do. It's uh, They're half right about that. The Nosferatu don't care so much about the Camarilla, the Sabat, and the Anarchs because this is the one and only clan that puts the clan before the faction. It's the only group that does that. Uh, the Zemichi kind of, sort of, but the Zemichi is just so factored. Um, never mind. But the Nosferatu hate the Toreador just for being beautiful. That's it. That's the one reason they hate them. They're kind of shallow. I did... I was meaning to continue writing that story of cult living in Canada and actually introduce, like, a Nosferatu who was kicked out of Vancouver for, you know, by a uh, Toreador who knew that he knew too much through Auspex. And, you know, named him Martin, and he lived in, like, a treatment plant outside of the town, and Colt would bring him, like, a case of beer and a cigar once a month to talk to him about what he knew. Yeah, there's, there's a reason you might keep these guys alive when you find them, because they are very knowledgeable people. That needs good conversation. Well, yeah, it's hard to look at, but after a couple of beers, it didn't matter. You, you gotta keep his fangs restrained and, like, possibly either tear off or tie his arms, and then just carry him back to... Well, prefer oh, you gotta do it at night. Uh, back to the cairn, and then interrogate him. And the wealth of knowledge that he will eventually vomit. Yep. As we found out in the werewolf game as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving on. Ravnos. Huh? Zemichi. Uh, they are even scarier than the Malkavians. They make furniture out of people and all their havens look the same. They used to be brilliant, but now they're just fucking bloodthirsty terrorists. And transhumanism is a dumb concept. Being human is kind of fucking sick. Uh, but they really want vicissitude so they can make themselves look even prettier. This leads me to talk about the unique bloodline of the Volgir. Really? You spell this V O L L G I R R E. And their icon is a pair of angel wings. Where a certain guy, uh, one Felipe Volgir, decided that in order to reach absolute beauty, he needed to spec into vicissitude. 
So after getting a Zumichi to share blood with him and teach him how to use vicissitude, um, great job doing that because you just infected yourself with the virus that the Eldest shares with everybody, so now you're under his control. And in doing so, they actually use vicissitude for good because they are the best plastic surgeons in the world because they can just reshape your flesh and make it look like whatever you want to look like. I actually pulled up the uh, the picture of the plastic surgeon concept while you were talking about that. Exactly. Like it you says have, in... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you have the vicissitude, but at the same time, you are putting yourself in direct harm's way of the Eldest, because like we said with the Zumichi episode, the day the Eldest flips the switch, there goes your life. Basically. So in the pursuit of trying to become more beautiful and perfect... You screwed over your eternal life as a vampire. Yeah. Look, it says, it even says in the concept, it says, um, you have heard of something called vicissitude, a power to shape and mold living tissue. Now you have dedicated yourself to discovering a vampire who possesses this power. You'd give just about anything to learn it. And then once you do learn it, it's all over. But on top of that, this is very dangerous because they can also shape shift with this power. So, um, as we know with uh, the rise of sex bots, uh, like with like character AI and Talkie, um, the short-term immediate benefit of just talking to a sex bot and then getting your sexual gratification out of that, um, you can do that IRL with the Volgear, where either you change your face every time you go to the same person and then just roleplay out that sex, or you go to the same person multiple times that they don't know you as, and you end up having like a 50 first, first date situation where you deceive them into uh, you know having sex with you having sex with you about 50 different times under different monikers that's honestly kind of fucking hilarious but also really cruel but something that a toriador would 100% do absolutely given how detached they are from human interaction sometimes yes uh moving on from that their best Friends in the whole world, the Ventru, the Toreador, love the Ventru. The Ventru will clean up any mistake they make. They make money as vampires, and they'll let you do whatever you want. They are kind of control freaks. They get kind of annoying, but the Ventru are the number one reason Zero, to zero Toreador will willingly leave the Camarilla for Anarch or Sabat. They love the Ventru. Was just, just that good. Uh, their relationship is the same relationship the Lasombro wish they had with with, uh, with the Zamichi. Yes, it, it, it's like the um, it, it's like the the Shadow Lords and the Korax. Uh, speaking of um, speaking of those werewolves, yes, the Garrow. Uh, as the book recalls, I can I actually have the pages for this, but they are very uh, they are very crunchy, so mind that. All right, low quality. Sorry about that. Yes. As the book recounts, and I love this quote, picture an eight-foot-tall shag carpet soaked with blood, yours. Add in a self-enforcing masquerade that makes every mortal who sees one start gibbering and hallucinating about chainsaw-toting maniacs, gangbangers, road cops, or whatever the urban legend works best. Now make it so that every time you hurt one, it heals quicker than you can say, Oh, shit, you're not going to tear me another new asshole, are you? Congratulations. Now you have some slight inkling of what lupines are like. If you go out into the woods, you run the risk of having one's death, one of death's own guard dogs pounce on you and use you for target practice. By woods, I mean anywhere without street lights. Lucky for them, shape changers are allergic to cities by and large. They have never heard of the glass walkers. Or the bone nars, it seems. Uh, they as, actually yes. do, do have a relationship with the Shadow Lords. Really? It's coming from the Shadow Lords. Oh, because, yeah, that's right. Jan Peter's in. Yeah, and the Shadow Lords in question have bought their way, muscled their way into the, uh, into the Camarilla thanks to the deadlock control they have over Russia today after stealing it from underneath the Silver Fangs. So now that they're talking with the Camarilla of Russia that extends to Europe and Asia, well, what, what little um, canines there are in Asia, and eventually that makes its way over to uh, America. And now you've got them rubbing shoulders with not just the Ventru, who were 
the guest they were after, but the Toreador as well. It's a... It's, and, wow. Yeah. You can imagine the fun times that a Shell Lord and a Toreador can have together. I believe we paired them up in our Vampire versus um, our yeah, Vampire versus Werewolf video. If I recall, yeah, that was right. But yeah, that, that would be interesting. That will... That would be a weird combination of like dating a venture and a bruja at the same time with the Shadow Lords from their perspective. Yeah, it would, except the, the Shadow Lord would be a lot sneakier about it. And, and on I, top of that, you could, of course, trick the werewolf into taking your blood, getting blood bound to you, and the promise of them getting a free gift in the form of, di of a discipline instead. Yes. I also do like so, this. Uh, yeah, what's up? I was going to say, if you thought the Toradora had a bunch of jail-free cards already, having a Gould Shadow Lord working with them, behold, they're now untouchable. Until somebody uses Detect Worm, then they're fucked. Um, actually, actually, there's no worm involved, it's all Weaver. Oh, fuck. We need a Detect Weaver spell, what the hell? Um, you gotta join the glass workers for that one. God damn it. Anyway. Uh, I like this last paragraph in the Lupine section. I know I've, like, read this verbatim, but that's only because it's really funny. I remember the day Jean Wharton, a gang girl from way back, got turned practically inside out and hung in the doors of Miami's Elysium. I took one look and thought, now that's what the masquerade is for. Fuck the mortals. I'm hiding from the werewolves. <laughs> I thought that was fucking hysterical. I think that the the Gav Famers were behind that one. More than likely. Uh, the mages. Um, so when it comes to the mages, they are people that bend reality to their, world, their will with just a thought. The narrator hasn't seen it themselves. Their blood tastes about the same. Um, but the, the book recounts an interesting story where a Tremere tried to put up a chantry outside of their town and it vanished without a trace and the kindred who knew about who knew about it took 6 months to realize that it was gone they just forgot that it was there some warlocks had gone up to see what had happened to it and you know they just saw it was absolutely overwhelming you know they had some neat tricks to play but you know they they have some they have some more darker secrets to hide they're kind of scary after all, um, looking at the mages in question, I honestly don't think the toy door would gel with any of them besides the Celestial Chorus. Or the Cult of Ecstasy. Uh, the Cult of Ecstasy, yeah, but that's... It's probably going like, to be like the same old, same old what to do with everything else. Yeah, it's like, hey, I heard you got drugs and sex. Cool. See, I, I, I have more drugs and sex than you. Uh -uh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> fairies, um, they seem like they're some kind of human soul parasites. They hate the, sh the, the fairies hate the shit out of them, which is weird because they seem drawn to civilization. You know, they heard an interesting story about a cat fight between one of the Toreador and some fey noble called the court in the court of the sun king. Um, both of them wanted to be, quote, girl with the most cake for some painter who saw the vampire by night and the fey chick by day. And the fairy got drained and the Toreador went insane and could never paint again. That's about how it ends up. Pretty stories, ugly endings. Uh, I'm sure they would certainly look beautiful and that would set off the clan weakness of the Toreador where they would just start staring at the fairy. Enough time for them to line up a perfect headshot with their bow and arrow, and then that's the last thing they ever see. Basically, yes. Uh, <laughs> ghosts. Usually, you don't have to worry about them. They don't do much. But once you live, once you unlive a little bit longer, you'll start to see them. But after a while, you'll see them all over the damn place. Um, as the book recalls, I've heard stories of victims coming after some vampire who couldn't keep the distinction between feed bag and body bag clear, but they've never experienced it them themselves. Um, but there seems to be a lot of them around recently. I'm not sure what that's about, but the odds are good. Ghosts are going to be the least of your concerns. Well, and, uh, you, you paid the Shamir to handle that. Yes. And then you have zombies. 
Sometimes ghosts get fed up with being a ghost and climbs back into its own body, claws its way out of the dirt, and then starts beating the shit on whatever it was that killed it. Uh, basically, as the book recalls, it's a brua that doesn't need blood and doesn't care about sunlight. Good luck. Uh, this next mm. one's an interesting now, one. Kyle, What's up? Now, Kyle, the thing is, is that I'm wondering if the person who wrote this book also worked on Wraith the Oblivion, because that's they're talking about Risen with that portion. Seems they are. Kind of gets the yeah. noggin jogging. Next, the yeah, so, uh, you, you brought in the person person who wrote Wraith for one good entry, and then that's about it. Yes, uh, the Kuei Jin, otherwise known in the first edition book as the Cathians. Um, so they aren't Canites as far to their knowledge. They're far more resistant to sunlight. They feed differently, and they hate the shit out of the Toreador almost as much they hate them for being vampires as for being Western. Uh, nope. But aside from that, uh, there's some of them in California giving the Anarchs, you know, something besides the Camaro and Sabat to worry about. If they're lucky, they can trick the Anarchs into, into allying with the Sabat. So the Carthians will pick on, or the, yeah, Cathinians will pick on them. Cathayans. Cathayans, whatever. For being the dominant vampire sect, while the Camaro will swoop in from behind and take over. Uh, the, the major advantage that the Camarilla has over the Kuei Jin is that the, um, is that Western vampires are far easier to make. The, uh, Kuei Jin, as we recall, take 20 years to make properly. Um, it's good because they have a nu numerical advantage and bad because the Kuei Jin tend to have their shit together. They are very good at what they do. They're organized by 100 different Melgin and Karna, also known as the Yama Kings. Yes. Uh, following that, the Hunters. They've heard some interesting reports about organizations of powerful mortals with, you know, powers far beyond what they can understand called the Modern Inquisition. They basically launched and declare war against anything that, you know, casts spells, sucks blood, or changes shape. Um... They've heard a couple of neonates got themselves staked or li staked or little or lit on fire, but they hear that the hunters have some sort of otherworldly power. Some have invisibility. Some can read minds. Some things can light them on fire with nothing. They thought it was hysteria, but they were really frequent and too coherent. I, I like this story about this uh, eighth generation Toreador called Annabelle. Uh, Annabelle out in Vancouver. Managed to capture one. She overwhelmed him with presents, fucked his brains out, bloodbound him, the whole nine yards. He should have been willing to kill or die for her pleasure, and it seemed like he was. She invited me out to take a look at and talk to him myself. Unfortunately, before I could get there, all hell broke loose. Here's what I gathered from her one child who survived. Annabelle was going to do some negotiating with the local Anarch's ghoul. She didn't trust the ghoul, so she told her, quote, pet hunter to be alert and watch out for her treachery. He nodded, and it seemed like he wanted nothing more than to serve and protect. Now, Annabelle was, an old and was old and cunning enough to know that no mortal ship rigger could fool her with a simple lie. Under but as soon as the ghoul walked in, the hunter blinked, shook himself, and attacked her. He was armed with nothing but a candlestick, but again, according to her child, the candlestick set her clothes on fire when he hit her. So, in about 30 seconds, this bloodbound human had shaken off the presence of an 8th generation Toreador and killed her with a single blow. And the child I'm was watching with Auspex. His aura was gold like a halo. Fun thing about this is that they say in the paragraph that cut off in that screenshot sent, the person that is giving them their, enti uh, their powers is a very generous entity. That's just the tip of the iceberg as to what an imbued hunter can do. Hunters so, are scary. Judgment Day is upon you. And we're, I'm running a Hunter Reckoning game on Fridays. And already my players have taken on... Uh, see, the best feat we've done so far is taken on a Setai and two ghouls. Two hunters by themselves did that and came up the winners. Back in the day, I was very good at what I did. Now, 
keep in mind, you weren't imbued. You were a hunter's hunter uh, vampire with the IAA. The powers from God vampire, uh, for, uh, powers from God hunters, the imbued is what they're talking about. And those are the guys that have the potential to smite all vampires off the face of the planet. Yep. There, that's and, like I said. I initially, when I was getting into World of Darkness, I compared playing Hunter to choosing to playing the humans in Alien versus Predator. But if you get imbued, oh, it's a whole new fucking ball game. You are Ripley with the flamethrower, my guy. Your powers come directly from God with the capital G. He is very vocal with you, by the way. And every power you get is fueled by conviction. Which is entirely fueled off of your personal mood, not anything around you, not the moods of others. So it's not no limitations of uh, pathos or glamour like Wraith and Changeling. It's all you and your own personal confidence. Yeah. So uh, that that it, it goes back to what I always say that I love about the world of darkness. No matter who you are. Or what you are, there's always something scarier than you. And the, uh, in terms of what's scarier than the hunters, wait until we talk about the tenacracy and we talk about threat null. Uh, it's nothing compared to God, actual God. You you remember? Did you ever watch Devilman Cry Baby? I did not, but I remember you gave me the idea of it. Like like episode twelve. Uh, has the rapture happened in it, and the entire rapture is ten seconds in length. Okay, okay. that's that's quicker yeah, than and, the third impact. Yeah, an angel flies down from heaven, touches the planet, and then a, an explosion the size of a continent goes off. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah, that's what you're dealing with at the end of Hunt, uh, Demon the Fallen. Well... We got our fucking work cut out for us, didn't we? <laughs> Gotta stop the apocalypse from happening. That seems to be a lot of our plot lines now, isn't it? And, I mean, that's why I like um, Old World Darkness so much, because, like, the stakes are so high in that game. That That's my biggest fear when it comes to my storytelling, because I don't think my stakes are high enough. It, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be that high. I mean, yeah, you could, of course, just like ch uh, chicken shit out and just run uh, Chronicles of Darkness instead. I don't think... No, <laughs> it's definitely not going to be that. Like, there's going to be consequences, but you won't get to... The thing is, is, like, and I hate to spoil my own story, your characters may or may not get to see what happens. And that de It all depends on what you do in the game. Yeah, how quickly those situations resolved. Well, it's, I, no, it's not going to be resolved. The situation never resolves. That's the thing. Yeah. It's an ongoing well, conflict. Yeah, like, and keep in mind, our vampire, our werewolf game started with a raid on a military base. Yeah. So that's just like the tip of the iceberg, and they can go wherever you feel like taking it from there, and even then, you can get a super personal story, like the story we told with Colt and his struggles with um, being a vampire for two years and seeing that his life was taken away from him. You can have stories like that. Exactly. And now we have, and, you know, teaching a, teaching a get ephemeris a rune to love. And they said, you can have, like, very interpersonal stories like that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's the and, relationships as far as it goes. Uh, shall we go with, uh, go ahead with mixing splats while you gear up for presents? Uh, yes. I'll let you, I'll let you start with that. I actually need to hit the head real quick, so I will let you mix some splats, and I will be right back. See, in terms of mixing splats, when it comes to combining your games with other stuff, the Toreador would be a fantastic mixture with the Shadow Lords. That's just a very good idea to have already because the Shadow Lords love talking to vampires. They're, they're werewolves that pretend they're vampires some days. As for who else, the Black Furies live in Greece, which is the favorite country of the Toreador. So they're bound to bump into each other at some point. You can have the occasional uh, Toreador that learns about the secret of Arakel is out in Greece looking for her tomb and then comes across, say, the Sept of Bygone Visions or just a protector of Black Furies 
and watch as shit will hit the fan after that happens. Bone Nars, they wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole. Same with the Children of Gaia. I mean, they're they're not really into hippie shit. The Fianna, I don't see a Toreador ever going to an Irish pub because that's below their um, how much you want to spend on a Friday night. I mean, if they're not spending two hundred dollars at a bar, they're not going to that bar. Um, get a Fenris. There was a small conflict in the book during the uh, Byzantium period where the Toreador were sending out missionaries to different members of barbaric and pagan tribes. And the Toreador were converting all these different pagans to Christianity the best way a Toreador can. Kyle, would you like to guess how? Uh, by showing them the holiest of holes. Yes, the, the glory hole. <laughs> Such as it's called. I'm and glad I came back convert, just in time for that. <laughs> and they would convert Gaia Fenris to Christianity by having sex with the Gaia Fenris. I feel like that's a quick way to, you know, ghoul a Gaia Fenris. Yeah, it's... it's The Gaia Fenris are Gaia's favorite pack. But even then, if you're up against a vampire with that much presence, you're going to have your moment of weakness. As everything does. Glasswalkers would hate the Toreador because the Glasswalkers are firmly up the asses of the Giovanni. Um, guess what? Two clans don't talk. They want, want to talk to the Toreador. Uh, Red Talons, no. Wendigo, no. Actena, no. Stargazers, no. Sorofa- uh, Sant Striders, no. Sorofangs. During a They moment were bound of- to run into each other during the Byzantium period. But besides that, I don't think the Surfang would have any interest in the Toreador and would probably order their deaths. More than likely. Unless they were feeling some odd, you know, senile uh, outburst of youth, I guess. And Black Spirals, the minute a Toreador sees one, they're going to request that that thing dies. And they're going to immediately run over to the Tremere and say, Can you please kill this disgusting mangy demon that I just saw in the alleyway? And the Ventru will kindly, you know, console the scared Toreador and say, not to worry, my child. Uh, Gangrel, Bruja, could you take care of that, please? Throw him at the wall, see if it sticks. <clears throat> oh, we got lucky in Vegas. <laughs> uh, mages. The Akashics, given that the Toreador just aren't in Asia at all, um, sadly nothing, I got nothing for you. Celestial Chorus. Given how Raphael got his start Yes, they would love to talk with the Celestial Chorus. They would love to tempt the Celestial Chorus. There's this little segment in, um, in uh, I believe it's the Celestial Chorus's book, where Gilgamesh was almost tempted by a Toreador into, into betting her. Given the phrasing of that passage, it could have been Arakel herself that was tempting Gilgamesh. Given the given the Chad that Gilgamesh was in, you know, in his epics written by Homer... That, that honestly wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. And he, of course, says no. He waits until a marriage and then leaves Arakel. But have you been in some like the, like the really old uh, cathedrals? I haven't, but I've got a friend, a choir director at my church. He sent me pictures of like his trip to Notre Dame and um, Berlin, Germany, about going into the cathedrals they have in Europe. And he says that's some of the most beautiful architecture he's ever seen. I got to go to um, like, uh, like a Middle Ages cathedral when I went to Czech, when I went to Prague. And that was a really awesome experience because you got to see just this is a place that's got that much history behind it. Behind it and there's all these different relics inside the church. And it was awesome being a part of that. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Like the Europe is cool so to- full of antiquity. It's really incredible. It it really was like the the hub of uh, Western society. Yes. Next up, you got the cult of ecstasy, where that's more of the same of what the Toreador are doing. They'll talk, but not for very long. Pretty much. Uh, dream speakers, you gotta move to the city if you want the Toreador to talk to you. Uh, same with the Euthantos. Same with the Verbena. Uh, Sons of Ether, Hermetics, and Virtual Adepts. 
they might come across each other once in a blue moon, but the Toreador don't really invest in technology or Harry Potter books or wizardry. So they, I don't see them interacting that much. They didn't like the Shadow Wizard money gang. We love casting spells. Uh, who else? Uh, I saw that. Uh, you got a recommendation as to Mage the Awakening. I think that would be a Hermetic in um, Ascension. I mean, I did think I planned on being a Hermetic if we ever got around to Mage. And of course, if that doesn't work, you could just make a Marauder. <laughs> I mean, it'd be funny. Legalized or, nuclear or, bombs. Uh, speaking of the Marauders, um, that would drive a Toreador insane. They wouldn't be able to live the tale the tale of uh, encountering a Marauder. Uh, hollow ones. Uh, would not interact with them. It's too, too poor. You, you don't talk to poor people. <laughs> uh, see, you got a green uh, text from a hollow one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nefandi, no, they, they're not okay with Satanism. They don't like that. Um, Next up, the Technocrats. Iteration X, no. Progenitors, unless they're buying makeup from them, no. New World Order, no. Void Engineers, no. The Syndicate. I can see them talking with the Syndicate because the Syndicate have money. Money. We've got to have money. money. Yeah, so, so, of course, you could just buy the Toreador for a million dollars to sleep with you for one night. Yeah, they probably got that kind of cash. Yep, and it will, and it will be the best night of your life. It will be a night that was definitely worth one million dollars, and then the Toreador will take the money and is gone afterwards. I mean, it, it, it was a service. I mean, if you wanted her to stay for breakfast, you should have paid for her breakfast. There we go. Dude, or just the, been the her breakfast. Very high. <laughs> yes. Rates. I don't see the Toreador really doing anything with them because they don't like the Wraiths and will want to get away from the Wraith as soon as possible. Yeah. As we said during relationships, it's like you probably won't see them, but they're if you do see them, they're the least of your worries. Changelings, that's going to be the ultimate schmuck bait in your game or just have a changing walk in front of a Toreador. They will get their weakness where they just stare at beauty will go off and behold, you will die. Unless it's a... A Slua or a Red Cap, I don't think would set that off. No, the the Slua or Red Cap would just straight up fucking kill them. As you you just hear the the Red Cap screaming like the zombies in Dead Island, and before it leaps on top of the Tory door and bites its scalp off. God, I love Donny. Um, and then Hunted Reckoning, we already described as to how dangerous hunters can be. I do like in Vampire: The Masquerade Bloodlines. It's not the imbued hunters. But there's a there's a Toreador that you meet in that game, and she is a fantastic NPC. I I'll like sometimes like go back and rewatch her scene because I can't tell if she is genuinely sympathetic for you or if she's being really sarcastic with you the entire time with her dialogue. Her voice actor just does that good of a job. I've really got to fucking sit down and play that game, but I just have not had the fucking time. Uh, you can stream it. That'll be a fantastic game to stream. I know, but like I said, I just don't have. I straight up don't have the time. My schedule's all kinds of jammed up. And looking at that, that that NPC's name is Velvet Valor, and she specifically pulls you into her strip club. Uh, she she doesn't own it. She's one of the dancers there because she wants to see people look at her, and she says you need to stay here because the street is swarming with hunters. So that late raises history. How much does she know about hunters? Has she met and imbued in the past? And has she killed one? Or has she seen one kill a Toreador? And it raises all these different interesting questions based off that one line she has. Yeah, I mean, if you spec enough, I imagine, into uh, a cult or intelligence, you might be able to pry deeper. Uh, you can do that with the Malkavian, and then you freak her out. She refuses to talk to you after that. <laughs> the classic Toreador Malkavian interaction. See, I, I hate my brother's legacy. It, it wasn't and, his fault. It's technically Kane's fault. And as for Erakel herself, as of 1999, she's awake. Yes. Wait, how did and she? How it, did she wake? I know she's awake. How did she wake up? 
1999, uh, flipped the switch, all of them got up at the same time. Oh, yeah, the Red Star, it, I remember. And Ravnos, with his massive power, just like Ravnos being on the planet for three days, woke up any Antiluvian who was asleep. <clears throat> well, yeah, they had to, you know, sunbeam him. And now, Erakel, the way that I run her in our in our Werewolf and Vampire game is that she's the God Queen. May I reign forever, and may I sit on your face for all time. And you will le learn to love me as, as your God Queen. But I also think that, alternatively, Erakel would just want to be left alone just to consume art. Much like the rest of her clan, I imagine. Yeah, well, Erakel herself didn't really come off as somebody with that much in terms of aspirations or ambition. So she might just be, say, walking around Greece or po possibly Italy, maybe Germany, just minding her own business and you just wouldn't recognize her on the street. She'd be an extraordinarily beautiful woman, but you just think that. You wouldn't suspect her to be a vampire. Oh, yeah, definitely. She probably just, like, goes from museum to museum, just, you know, remembers all the good times. And... Speaking of encountering her, if you are to fight her in any of your games, we'll get into detail with presence in just a minute, but seeing Eric Hill, smelling her, hearing her voice, hearing her heartbeat as she pumps it manually using Blush of Life, being in the same room as her, seeing her reflection or seeing her picture would put you automatically under the effects of presence. Well, shit. So that's the reason why she's still alive. It's because she's too beautiful for anyone to bring themselves to kill her. Uh, what about the eldest? The eldest? I think, like, when everything's dead, he will assimilate her, but then, like, keep her the way she is physically just to keep in his giant Carpathian dungeon to, like, as a museum piece. Three. Behold... The apex of all creation. And with the worm, I think the worm is the only guy with the stones to try to kill Erakil. But That's because he doesn't give a fuck. I mean, it, he is the cosmic force of death, but any vampire, werewolf, um, come to think of it, the wild would... How could you improve perfect with the wild? Uh, the wild would try to evolve her, but how could you go further from Erakel? Well, I don't know if the wild is necessarily going to improve her. It might just keep trying different things to see if any of them stick. And of course, the weaver, the minute the weaver sees Erakel, will immediately come over with the weaver glue spray and then spray her still. Yes. It's like stay behold, right she's where not you are. She's now perfectly preserved. Nothing can destroy her. Yes. God, the weaver <laughs> sucks. <laughs> of all the like, of all the terrible things that come out of the world of darkness, the weaver's just fucking boring. I think you hate the weaver more than you hate the worm. I do. I really do. <laughs> as somebody who's an I who is a recent iOS graduate, as somebody who has been tangled in its webs for the past four years. Fuck the Weaver, we'd be better off without it. And come to think of it, Demon the Fallen, I almost forgot about that, Demon the Fallen. I don't think Ravagers you could Faustian bargain a to Well, actually, you absolutely could Faustian bargain a Toreador. Yes, you could. Uh, the Faustians, of course, love to get involved in that, saying, would you like to be the most beautiful thing, not on the planet, but in the cosmos? Oh, would and you, you like go to be there? there. It's quite lit this is quite literally the Robert Johnson deal. It's like you'll make you'll be one fine guitar player. <laughs> uh, Ravengers would also be the other group that would try to kill her. Same with the Earthbound. The Reconcilers protect her at all cost. Um, same with the Cryptics, where I think the Cryptics would try to figure out, you know, how did somebody this pretty come into existence? Yep. Capture it, try to replicate its success. And Lucifer, the Luciferians. I think, honestly, Lucifer might approach Erakel and try to make her his second wife. Hey, baby. 
I mean, whatever happened between him and Lilith, that's not gonna that's not gonna take off anymore. Uh, I imagine we'll get to that when we get to talking about the Luciferians in the far future. So, behold, Erakil, you will indeed be the god queen of the planet after Lucifer takes over. That would be kind of fucking funny. Of course, you would be stuck living in Barbie land, where th that actually is what Lucifer wants to turn the world into, where his big invisible hand reaches down and does everything for you. Because the world's too dangerous for my precious little baby humans to live in, and I have to do all this for you because I can't let you ever experience pain. I, You know, see, I was tearing on the weaver for being, you know, a prissy piece of shit, but now, Lucifer, you're starting to remind me of someone I really dislike. <laughs> I thought you were all right, you know, wanting to do the wanting to do the best for humanity. But it, it, I I think you're starting to you're starting to lose the plot, my guy. It's that it's that episode from Codename Kids Next Door. We had the safety bots who wrap the world in, sh in bubble wrap because they're too scared of kids getting hurt. Exactly. Uh, exactly that that that's what he wants to do. <laughs> What, where are the ups and downs, the bruises and the bumps that make life so goddamn fun and interesting? No, mandatory happiness. You have to be happy all the time. You can't experience anything else. It reminds me of that one episode of uh, the Treehouse of Horror where Bart can, like, mutate people with his mind. So the people of Springfield must always think happy, sp must think happy thoughts and wear happy <laughs> smiles for fear of upsetting a ten-year-old boy. He's going to send you to the cornfield otherwise. Basically, yes. And now we can talk about the presence. Yes, the claim to fame of Toreador. We talked about how Arakel has it, and they are the perfectors of it. Presence, the discipline of, a man, of emotional manipulation. With it, you can inspire passionate fervor, unreasoning terror in mortals and kindred alike. Some of Presence's powers can be used on entire crowds at one time. It transcends race, religion, gender, class, and most importantly, supernatural nature. The subtle power is one of the most useful disciplines a vampire can possess. And starting from the top, we have awe. Those near the vampire suddenly desire to be closer to her and become receptive towards their point of view. Awe is extremely useful for mass communication. It matters little what is said, the hearts of those affected lean towards the vampire's opinion. The weak want to agree with her, even if the strong-willed resist. They soon find themselves outnumbered. All can turn a sh uh, chancy deliberation into a certain resolution in the vampire's favor almost before her opponents know that the tide is turned. Despite the intensity of this attraction, those so smitten do not lose their sense of self-preservation. Danger breaks the spell of fascination, as does leaving the area. Those subject to awe will remember how they felt in the vampire's presence, however. This will influence the reaction should they ever encounter them again. System! The player spends a blood point and rolls charisma and performance at difficulty 7. The number of successes rolled determines how many people are affected, as noted on the chart below. If there are more people present than the character can influence, awe affects those with lower willpower ratings first. The power stays in effect for the remainder of the scene or until the character chooses to drop it. Uh, one success will yield one person, two successes is two people, three yields six, four, twenty, five, everyone in the vampire's immediate vicinity, an entire auditorium or a mob of people. Those affected can use willpower points to overcome the effect, but must continue spending willpower every scene for as long as they remain in the same area as the vampire. As soon as an individual spends a number of willpower points equal to the successes rolled, he shakes off the awe completely and remains unaffected for the rest of the night. You get that as soon as you start playing. Now, compare this to Dominate, where Dominate is very good at first level, but that only works on one person. Granted, you're able to get super specific with details, but this affects multiple people. And as we saw with Tabitha in our vampire game, you didn't get to see what we did. This became the go-to discipline in any situation. Yes. So basically, if if discipline or if uh, dominate was an emotional sniper rifle, awe is an emotional grenade. So <laughs> 
so good. It's so good. Yeah. So ba- basically, uh, it, it dominate is very personal. It's dear sir or madam, all is to whom it may concern. And given all, it concerns everybody in a radius. To number two, dread gaze. While all kindred can frighten others by physically revealing their true vampiric natures, bearing claws and fangs, glaring with malevolence, hissing loudly with malice, this power focuses these elements to insanely terrifying levels. Dread gaze uh, engenders unbearable terror in its victims, stupefying him into madness, immobility, or reckless flight. Even the most stalwart individual will fall back from the vampire's horrific visage. System. The player rolls charisma and intimidation, difficulty equal to the victim's wits and courage. Success indicates the victim is cowed, the f- while failure means the target is startled but not terrified by the sight. Three or more successes means he runs away in abject fear. Victims who have nowhere to run crawl at the walls, hoping to dig a way out rather than face the vampire. Moreover, each success subtracts from the target's uh, action dice pools next turn. The target may attempt dread gaze once per turn against a single target, though she may also perform it as an extended action, adding her successes in order to subjugate the target completely. Once the target loses enough dice that he cannot perform any action, he's so shaken and terrified that he curls up on the ground and weeps. Failure during the extended action means the attempt falters. The character loses all of her collected successes and can start over next turn while the victim may act normally again. A botch at any time indicates the target is not at all impressed, perhaps even finding the vampire's antics comical, and remains immune to any further uses of presence by the character for the rest of the story. So, there is a bit of give and take with this. It has the ability to, um, it has the ability to fuck you over later if you botch. So, watch your willpower very, very carefully when using this. Yes. But... Yeah, once again, uh, just another good power to have. At level two, no less. Like, like in in standard second edition rules, you get I think it was like three or four blood point or three or four points in each discipline to spend um, to spend individually. You, get you three points, three points. You could get this at the start of the game. Exactly. So it, it's very very powerful to have. Which moves on to level 3, Entrancement. This power bends others' emotions, making them the vampire's willing servants. Due to what these individuals see as true and enduring devotion, they heed the vampire's every desire. Since this is done willingly, instead of having their wills sapped, these servants retain their creativity and individuality. While these obedient minions are more personable and spirited than the mind slaves created by Dominate, they're also somewhat unpredictable. Further, since entrancement is of a temporary duration, dealing with a lapsed servant can be troublesome. A wise kindred either disposes of these, uh, uh, disposes of those she entrances after they serve their usefulness, or binds them more securely by a blood bond, made much easier by the minion's willingness to serve. System. The player spends a blood point and rolls appearance and empathy with a difficulty equal to the target's current willpower. The number of, su- of successes determines how long the subject is entranced, as per the chart below. Subjects can still spend willpower to temporarily resist, like any other presence power. The storyteller may wish to make the role instead, since the character is never certain of the strength of her hold on the victim. The vampire may try to keep the subject under her thrall, but can do so only after the initial transmit wears off. Attempting this power while entrancement is already in operation has no effect. So... A botch subject cannot be entranced for the rest of the story. Failure on the subject cannot be entranced for the rest of the night. One success is equal to one hour. Two successes, one day. Three, one week. Four, one month. Five, one year. You could, with five successes, you could have somebody entranced for a full fucking year. Again. And now we're getting to the point where we're better than dominate. Yes. Again, if you spec all three of your starting points into presence... You have this at the start of the game. Goodness gracious. One blood point. Yes. It's it's insanely cheap. And in second edition, you get so many blood points late in the game. And given given that uh, all humans have shit in terms of stats, this will always go off on a human. Yes. 
So you could just you'll have your army of simps at the start of the game with entrancement. Get, get, pull up the simp sauce. I do not have the simp sauce. <laughs> See, I, I got the picture for you. Why do you have the simp sauce? See, I just did like a quick Google search there. Yeah, there it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on from that, we have Summon, uh, level four. This impressive power enables the vampire to call herself any person whom she has ever met. This call can go to anyone, mortal or supernatural, across any distance within the physical world. The subject of the summons comes as fast as he is able, possibly without even knowing why. He knows intuitively how to find his summoner, even if the vampire moves to a new location. The subject redirects his own course as soon as he can. After all, he's coming to the vampire herself, not some predetermined site. Although, this power allows the vampire to call someone across a staggering distance. It is most useful when used locally, even if the desired person books the next available flight, getting from Kyoto to Milwaukee can still take far longer than the vampire needs. Obviously, the individual's financial resources are a factor. If he doesn't have the money to travel quickly, it will take him a far greater time to get there. The subject thinks mainly of reaching the vampire, but does not neglect his own well-being. This is less of a consideration if he has uh, to cross a room, unless he must go through a gang of gun-wheeling punks to do so. The individual retains his survival instincts, and while he won't shirk, uh, shirk physical violence to react to the vampire's side... He won't subject himself to suicidal situations. The summoning dissipates at dawn, unless the subject is trained to continue toward the vampire after the first call. The immortal must summon each night until the target arrives. Still, as long as the vampire is willing and able, she is assured to greet her desired subject some night, as long as nothing happens to him along the way, of course. System. The player spends a blood point and rolls Charisma and Subterfuge. The base difficulty is 5. This increases to 7 if the subject was met only briefly. If the character used Presence successfully on the target in the past, this difficulty drops, for, drops to 4. But if the attempt was unsuccessful, the difficulty rises to 8. The number of successes indicates the subject's speed and attitude in responding. Successes. A botched suspect. The subject cannot be summoned by that vampire for the rest of the story. Failure cannot be summoned by the rest of the night. One success, uh, sub the subject approaches slowly and hesitantly. Two, they approach reluctantly and is easily thwarted by obstacles. Three, they approach with reasonable speed. Four, with haste overcoming any obstacle in the way. Five, they rush to the vampire doing anything to get to them. Jesus. Yeah, so quite literally, Tabitha could call over Ragnar from New York uh, overnight, basically. He would have to take a flight to get there, and then she would likely have to call him over to Italy the following day after the flight lands, but she could if she wanted to. Now, now keep in mind, she did use this in the over the course of our vampire game to summon pretty much 20 different guys when we, when we were completely out of blood points. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wasn't that near the end yeah. of the game? <laughs> yeah, that was towards the end of the game where we said, hey, we need blood points. She said, I gotcha. Oh, yeah, I remember and we had, just... like, all those, like, other, like, Camarilla ghouls around us. Yeah, and, and on top of that, that was the same day I brought in King Arthur, uh, the Ventru. Hey, so, buddy. behold, we were completely stacked after that happened. You know, I, I really like King Arthur. It's sad that I don't see him more often in the game. Uh, don't don't worry, back. he's about to, he's about to get his day in the sun in two weeks. Oh, good lord! Not uh, like you mean metaphorically, right? Yes. Okay, I was like, oh, you're gonna kill, you're gonna kill Elvis. Damn it! You're gonna kill before you get to fight him. Yeah. Uh, Majesty. At this stage, the vampire can augment her supernatural mane a thousandfold. The attractive becomes. Paralyzingly beautiful, the homie becomes hideously twisted. Uh, ma majesty inspires universal respect, devotion, fear, or all at once in those around the vampire. The weak scramble to obey her every whim, and even the most dauntless find it impossible to deny her. People affected find the vampire so formidable that they dare not risk her displeasure. 
Raising their voices to her is difficult. Raising a hand against her is unthinkable. Those few who shake off the vampire's potent mystique enough to oppose her are shouted down by the many under her thrall before the immortal need even respond. Under Majesty's influence, hearts break, power trembles, and the bold shake. Wise kindred use this power with caution against mortal and immortal alike. While Majesty can cow influential politicians and venerable primogen, the vampire must be careful that doing so doesn't come back to haunt her. After all, a dignitary brought low before others loses his usefulness quickly, while a humiliated kindred has centuries to plan revenge. System. No role is required on part of the vampire, but she must spend a willpower point. A subject must make a courage roll difficulty equal to the vampire's charisma and intimidation to a maximum of 10, if he wishes to be rude or simply contrary to the vampire. Success allows an individual to, enact, to act normally for the moment, although he feels the weight of the vampire's displeasure crushing down on him. A subject who fails the role aborts his intended action and even goes to absurd lengths to humble himself before the vampire, no matter who else is watching. The effects of majesty last for one scene. This is your Uno reverse card. If things are not going your way, and you need to turn the tables immediately... You have majesty. Again, be careful because that can come back to haunt you in the story, but that is there if you absolutely need it. It's That pretty much is just the solve problem for me card, where the minute you use that, all conflict, all stake is out the window. I yes. just play this, and I win. Except then you have to have like another game a year down the line where hey that one that one you know uh, venture primogen who is talking shit uh he's back and he's pissed. Hold, I'm now reliving the consequences of my actions. Well, well, well. If it isn't the the consequences of my actions, <laughs> I fucking love that. Yeah, uh, presence is busted. Fucking busted. Yeah, this, this is probably the best display in the game next to Obtenebration. Nothing is going to beat Obtenebration in terms of just raw destructive combat power. This is close. This is close, well, in terms of being the best discipline in the game. But in social situations, this is it's almost required to have this whenever you play Vampire. Yes. So even though we said at the start that Toreador is a very easy clan to start with, play a Toreador because they're fun and incredibly useful, especially in a roleplay heavy game. The other clans who get this are the Bruja, the Setites, the Ravnos, and the Ventru. That's probably why but... I like the Ravnos so much. <laughs> And like we said, it is it is the Toreador who took this and perfected it. Nobody's better at using this to get what they want than the Toreador. Uh, correction, there, nobody's better than the Toreador. <laughs> now, there, there are two clans you need to look out for. The Bali, who have this. You, you know, the Satanists. Yes. And some bloodlines of the Tremere also have this, too. Did Nozomi have it? No, he did not. He had uh, Dominate. Yes. Uh, you know what? Now, I didn't bloody work. I mean, I did it. And look who's still alive, you fat bastard. <laughs> now, here's your curveball for tonight, Kyle. Yes. Now, you may be wondering, why did you just post a lipstick stain in the Discord chat? Uh, Why is that? Because we have a weird middle ground clan between the Toreador and the Malkavians, known as the Daughters of Cacophony. Oh boy. Where these are technically Toreador, but they have the derangement of Malkavians. That derangement being they hear music 24-7 and it never turns off. That sounds very familiar. Where... um. That stupid Jason Derulo song where, uh, was it like trumpets, where every time you see a girl and like a different song will play every time you see one? Oh, yeah. Uh, Talk Dirty to Me? No, I think, I think it was just called Trumpets. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking but, of the saxophone. Yeah, that's what, 
I'm, I'm also thinking of um, was it that that scene in Family Guy where Peter wishes for his own theme music? Oh yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Where you're on a bus and you start hearing that song every time you step on the bus. Yeah, now, I, I mean, to be fair, I do that with a licensed soundtrack. Now, here's the crazy stuff you can do with their twisted version of Presence, known as Melpomene. I'm going to very quickly go through this with you. Okay. The Missing Voice, level 1. The character can throw their voice to anywhere within sight, and it will sound as if they're talking from that position. You do not need to stay where you threw your voice to. You can have that camp there. Next up, the Phantom Speaker. The daughter can't project her voice of any individual she has personally met. So now you're playing Parrot, where you can now copy anyone's voice. And you can combine that with the missing voice. Sounds incredibly useful. Third level, Madrigal. Music has the power to sway the listener. What this does is that after you roll Charisma and Performance, difficulty 7, you start singing, and the world begins to move to your song like it's a Mickey Mouse cartoon. Would you like to think about where you could go with that power? I'm... It... I, I up, am, goodness gracious, yeah. Next up, level 4, the Siren's Beckoning. Um, what this does is that you start driving people insane with just the sound of your voice. Uh, where your song will now cause madness along with the Mickey Mouse effect. And then level 5, we get Virtuosa. Where... See, most low level Pomene when Dora reaches this level. Uh, every member who uh, you can now start bending, like throwing out Phantom Speaker or Siren, Siren's Beckoning. Well, on a mass scale, one person hears you, everyone around the person you cast it on also hears it too. That is a very quick way to introduce mass psychosis. That sounds Alternately, terrifying. You have Mosh Pit. <laughs> where your song causes everyone around you, humans included, to enter frenzy. Quick, play the fight music! And next up is Primal Scream, where you scream so damn loud it shatters structures around you. I really want Mosh Pit. And there you go, the Dars of Cacophony, but that's the thing, you gotta listen to music all day, every day, and it never turns off. You gotta start playing Knocked Loose when, when, you, do the, when you do the Mosh Pit. Yeah. <laughs> Start playing Counting Worms, you just hear the guitar rake in the background. <laughs> and I think that's it. You do have Toridor Anti Tribute, but that is exceptionally rare. Yes. So. And I, th I think that's it, actually. Do you have that, any closing thoughts? Well, no. Like I said, like we said, the Toridor are easy to pick up and play. But they're also insanely useful. Presence is insanely powerful. And even though they don't do a whole lot as far as like Vampire Society as a whole, they are incredibly fun to play. Play Toreador. I, I have never seen or heard of a story of a vampire game that hasn't had at least one Toreador in it. That's because they're fun. It's it's like it's like having a cleric in D D. You just gotta have one in your party. Exactly, that's why I play Cleric. And that's that's what it is. This is the this is the most practical application vampire in the entire game. Yes. If you if you right. aren't like a specialized thing, you can do basically anything. Let's see, what did I put on the schedule for next week? I don't know, the but I, I honestly might not be around for that one because I have to help I have to help a friend on Sunday, so I might not be around for the Rokea. That will be a me and Ryan episode then. Yes, it will, unless something changes. But I'll keep you posted. Yeah, it's it sucks to the stuff by myself, but I control I can control more stuff in post than you can. Yeah, you can, or you can just send me yeah. under notes. But we'll we'll get it figured out. But yeah, it's, it's my, my my monkey brain hates editing. It's, that's fair. Yeah. All right. Or good, good yeah, uh, next episode is going to be the Were Sharks. So tune in for that one. Yes, mysteries from the deep. Good night, everybody. Yep. GN.